Thank you, Jen. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the February 22nd Board of Trustees meeting. It's one o'clock. Um, we welcome everyone to the board meeting. Um, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. It's now just about a minute after one. Um, we're going to be discussing some things in executive session today, uh, and there will be public comment before we go into executive session. We have some guests. Um, well, just to go back to the, 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 um, the public comment piece, um, we're going to have a link to sign up for the public comment. It's also gonna be in the chat. Uh, Jen will be the person who will be the host for that. And we're going to have a similar thing to what we did on Wednesday night, which we did for two hours. Uh, I can explain that when the time comes, but we're going to try to get as many people in as possible. And we're going to give everyone three minutes to um, make their statement. But in the meantime, we have a whole lot of other things that we're doing on this agenda. Uh, we've got some guests here, people from the um, NCHEMS, Dennis Jones and Brian Prescott will be here and Sophie will be going through her, her pr transformational proposal and uh, a lot of other regular business. Um, with that, I'm going to ask for the approval of the minutes of January 15th. Um, who would like to make a motion on that? So moved. Mary's made a motion on that. I need a okay. second. 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 Any discussion on the minutes from the January 15th board meeting? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, opposed? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. We now are gonna ask Catherine Lavasser to go and present a marketing um, proposal. Actually, they're marketing materials that have already been used. And she will discuss that and we will um, get, see a short video of that. So Catherine, um, you have, the, you have the, the table here. Thank you very much, Chair Dickinson. So recognizing that the Vermont State Colleges and our institutions are facing increasing and intensifying scrutiny in the legislature, in our host communities and across stakeholder groups, as the select committee reports are released and as the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees discusses the system's future, the Office of the Chancellor, in collaboration with the marketing directors at each institution, developed a six-week marketing campaign to run from January 25th through March 8th. This campaign is designed to shore up faith in the VSCS and remind Vermonters of our value with a secondary benefit of staving off enrollment declines as decisions about the future of the VSCS are discussed by the legislature and the board of trustees. This is a proactive effort to present the VSCS and its institutions as the strong, vibrant institutions that we all know are critical to the well being of students, communities, and Vermont as a whole. It is designed to bolster the VSCS image and restore confidence in our institutions to help reassure students and their families, as well as our communities that we will be here for generations to come. Our audience includes Vermont's education influencer market of teachers, guidance counselors, VSAC counselors, thought leaders and public officials with a secondary market of current and prospective students. The intention of this campaign is to complement the ongoing marketing efforts of the colleges and to ensure that our unified system message is out there as chatter intensifies around the board's actions and the select committee reports. The campaign is running on TV, radio, and with digital ads that point to a landing page, yourfuture.vsc.edu, that has a unifying message and links to the four colleges' websites. We estimate we will achieve approximately 3.3 million impressions throughout the campaign, and we, will have, and we have some strong preliminary results to share with you today from the first few weeks. We are running six weeks of digital TV and VPR advertisement. The digital ads include placement on the news website, vtdigger.org. Mm -hmm. Our non-VPR statewide radio and front porch forum advertising will conclude this week, and all advertising will finish on March 8th. Digital advertisements include banner ads, sidebar ads, and page advertisements like the selection shown here. This ad in the middle is our most popular ad across mediums, and we're seeing strong engagement across the board with these advertisements. 
On social media, we have nice interaction across all age groups, six, excuse me, 18 to 64, with a 1.58% click rate on the digital ads and a 2.13% click rate on the video ad. We have a 96% completion rate of our streaming audio ads, which includes placement on streaming apps like Spotify, Sonos, and CBS Radio. Our radio and audio ads use the same voiceover as the video ad, although some are a 15 second version. In OTT, and this is advertisement on streaming services like Apple TV, Hulu, and others that you might access on a smart TV or device, we are seeing good delivery in Bennington and Brattleboro, which is noteworthy as these are hard to reach in our TV buys for the Burlington based stations. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a 96% completion rate and strong delivery in the top 10 areas. On YouTube, we're doing slightly better with the 18 to 34 year old demographic, and we are seeing good engagement from our front porch forum ads and a strong number of independent visits to the landing page. And I'll now play the video ad for you. We are your Vermont State Colleges. We exist for the benefit of Vermont, providing diverse college experiences and the qualified workforce needed to grow our state's economy. 83% of our students are Vermonters, and two-thirds of our graduates continue to live and work in Vermont, providing health care, creating new businesses, educating our children, engineering solutions in new technology, and more. These are the professionals that create a dynamic community and a thriving economy. Look to your Vermont State Colleges to drive Vermont's future. So as I shared before, we're seeing strong engagement with the campaign. We will compile additional data when the campaign concludes next week and would be happy to share those final results with you. And I just want to conclude by thanking the marketing directors at the institutions. That's Sylvia Plum, Amanda Chalk, James Lambert, Katie Kezzy, and Danielle Brissett and their teams for their assistance with this project. They provided invaluable support and the teamwork necessary to get this off the ground in January. Thank you very much, Catherine. Nicely done. That was really very informative. I've seen them on TV and I'm sure I've seen them other places without even realizing it because it seems to be ubiquitous. <laughs> okay. Um, the next thing we have is a, is there any questions on yeah, that? I have, Mary, go I have ahead. one question. Um, I wonder if um, that somebody could send that clip to us as an email that could be then sent to local folks who are asking us questions. Sure. I okay. think, that, uh, Catherine, is that possible? I'd be happy to do that. So okay. I had a local comment that there's been no media coverage and I know there has been, but I wanna keep my local guys uh, in the loop. Good, very good point. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, the next thing, of course, is the presentation by Brian Prescott and Dennis Jones from Nenchems on the Select Committee's February 11th report. This is the second report. Uh, it's a mere 145 pages long, but I know everybody read it with great interest. It is longer than the first one and is more detailed. And um, uh, Sophie, do, would you like to, uh, as the Chancellor, would you like to introduce um, the gentleman from Nenchems for us? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so Brian Prescott and, and Dennis Jones um, are both with NCHEMS, uh, which I know Bill is going to want to know, National Center for, uh, I don't have it written out in front of me, Brian, tell me what the... <laughs> National Center for Higher Education Management Systems. There you go. Um, and so NCHEMS is a, is a nonprofit organization. Um, their mission is to improve strategic decision making in post secondary education for state systems, institutions, and workforce development organizations across the United States and abroad. And NCHEMS was selected um, by the steering committee of the legislatively created Select Committee um, to provide uh, consulting services to the Select Committee. And they were hired through the Joint Fiscal Office, and they have been working tirelessly, I will say, for months on this project um, to help the, uh, the select committee figure out the, the future of the Vermont State Colleges as well as other issues related to higher education in Vermont. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm assuming Brian, I know I've, Brian has testified a number of times in front of different legislative committees, um, but I know Dennis has also been part of our, our process here with the select committee. 
Yeah, before they start, I just want to let the board know this is your chance to really ask the questions and express your opinions and any any qualifying issues or anything that you have about the work of the select committee and what Brian and Dennis have been doing and their research and work. This is your chance after their presentation to really ask them whatever it is you think is important. Go ahead, Dennis or Brian, whoever's gonna start. I'll go ahead and kick us off and I'll, as usual, invite Dennis to chime in uh, and provide color commentary as we go forward. Um, first off, let me thank, thank all of you for uh, your attention to this, um, as Chair Dickinson said, lengthy report that we've, that we've drafted over multiple months. Um, and for the opportunity to come and speak with you this, I guess it's this afternoon for you all. It's still the morning for us. I would say uh, at, at, at the beginning that we would prefer, as I'm sure all of you would, to be with you in person. Uh, we've been doing all of this work from uh, a distance on Zoom, like, like all of you have been doing in your own uh, work professional lives. Uh, and we're doing the best we can. I think it's working all right. Uh, we, would, we would certainly rather be there and to uh, travel around the state to meet with stakeholders rather than do all this virtually. But I thought I would just kind of provide a, um, as a brief overview as possible of the report and, uh, and then we'll make ourselves available for questions from the, from the board. Um, the overview of, of the process uh, was after we were selected, I believe it was in late August, early September, we got to work immediately gathering and analyzing data from publicly available sources, but also from data requests we made and were rapidly um, fulfilled by the Chancellor's Office and also by folks at the University of Vermont as well. We have been uh, trying very hard, as I mentioned, to stay uh, connected and engaged with stakeholders through in individual interviews and focus groups. On that front, we've been ably supported by the New England Board of Higher Education, NEBI, who has helped uh, manage some of the, the logistics and the facilitation of some focus groups related to that. We also have been working in uh, a review of, working on a review of the documents, including the alternative proposals that have come forward for what to do about the Vermont State Colleges. Uh, over time. And then, of course, we've had regular meetings with the select committee and the steering group of the select committee. Um, the initial ones uh, related to that were to establish the select committee's goals and the criteria for evaluating recommendations. And these were all expressed as befitting the charge that was given to the select committee. These were expressed in terms of meeting students' needs and meeting states' needs. And um, as we go forward with this, we have written this report as, a, uh, as, a, as an effort to facilitate the work of the select committee. We've been fortunate and had terrific engagement by the members of the select committee. And they have uh, so far been willing to um, put forward this, these reports for the legislature uh, in a consensus sort of way. So um, as we, uh, as, as I go through this, I would like ask you to be mindful that we're presenting here um, the select committee's recommendations in part because we as an outside entity um, would think that the, the effectiveness of the work that we do is enhanced when folks in the state um, uh, really sort of own the, the results of the work that we're doing and carry it forward. And I think so far we, at, at Inchins, we've been pretty pleased with the level and degree of engagement by um, which we see from all of you as well, but also the select committee. So with that, we've had, we, we recognize some findings that, that change is, is necessary and, and, and has to take place. Um, the Vermont State Colleges are overbuilt, both in terms of personnel and facilities for the enrollment they currently have. That the, the solution to some of these challenges is gonna come from uh, both uh, creating administrative savings better service to students and outreach to new populations that have traditionally not been um, a focus area of a lot of the attention in Vermont, at least as we see relative to other states. Um, we see and understand there are good reasons to, to, to do everything possible not to close campuses. And so we have been uh, working on trying to put forward recommendations that actually are able, it is able to create the uh, uh, the kind of conditions that allow those campuses to be maintained. 
Uh, but up to this point, policies and practices in the Vermont State Colleges have been better serving institutional needs than the needs of students and the state. And so as we make these recommendations, we're, we're, we're mindful and as the select committee uh, adopted them and thought about them, uh, they did it from the perspective of meeting students' needs and meeting state needs. So the recommendations, there's um, 10 of the, there's 10 sort of buckets in the report, but really because we, we wrote the report the select committee put the report forward for the uh, legislature's consideration. Uh, we, the, the executive summer really captures the most important ones for their attention. And those include that the state really needs to adopt a sense of urgency about this. One of the things that we're, we're mindful of is the need for this change to be meaningful and sustained over a period of time. And in order for that to happen, this, the state legislature really needs to um, to maintain attention and, and express a sense of urgency around uh, the, the, the solutions. Um, missing in a, in, the, in, in a lot of the um, enacting legislation and, and other materials in Vermont is a set of strategic and objectives for the investment that the uh, state has been making in the Vermont State College system. And so the second recommendation argues that the legislature should define what those strategic objectives are uh, and then to use those objectives to help direct the investments that they make. Uh, obviously, the one I think that you'll probably be most, the ones you'll be most interested in are the, one, the three that, that come next. The first one has to do with restructuring. Uh, the next one after that comes with the need to coordinate administrative services. And then the, the fifth one has to do with the legislature needing to adopt strategic funding framework and to provide the kind of financial support necessary to achieve transformation and set the Vermont State Colleges up for success in having the, cap the capacity, the evolving capacity to meet changing state needs and to uh, address affordability issues that are sort of, um, uh, I hate to say this right now, but endemic in Vermont. Um, and then finally, the, fi the last one is an affordability standard that we uh, believe that would be helpful to Vermont and the legislature to recognize in, a, in an objective way, the degree to which their investments are or are not supporting affordability for students from different income backgrounds. That's missing right now in the, in the, uh, uh, in the sort of the, uh, the, blood, the bloodstream of the, of the public policies discussions in Vermont. It is in a, a number of other states as well. And you can see it in the drift that we have <coughs> years of, uh, uh, increasingly expecting students to pay the costs of higher education and nowhere more so than in Vermont in the country. Um, I'm going to now go back a little bit to the restructuring and address uh, a couple of items that have um, surfaced. Even though we're clear out in Vermont, we are aware that some of, some of these recommendations uh, deserve more attention than others. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, our recommendation around restructuring CCV and maintaining it as a separate institution because that uh, stands in contrast to what the labor task force, for instance, has proposed. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why we, uh, why, why the select committee has uh, adopted that recommendation. So the first um, reason is because CCV has a very different business model and its mission is quite different than the other three institutions. Um, it, it is, is non-residential. It has focused its attention on uh, sub-baccalaureate programming. Uh, a lot of that is related to uh, uh, workforce development initiatives that are localized. And there are a number of CCV locations scattered throughout the state. It is uh, the only one of the four that has consistently been balancing its budget, as I think you all well know. Um, and there's a real need in the state to maintain a low cost institution that provides affordable sub baccalaureate and non residential programming to individuals wherever they are, uh, particularly the kind of thing that is most relevant to the local uh, work uh, economic development needs of the of the communities that the campuses are located in or the sites are located in. Um, we also think that including CCV in the unification uh, of the other three institutions would really disrupt its business model, especially those elements of it that keep it fiscally sound relative to the others and allow it to be more adaptable and nimble in responding to the changing needs of the economy and students. 
and including uh, CCV into the larger institution risks reducing priority on those focus areas I mentioned before, especially service to adult learners and meeting employer needs. A second major uh, area that has, um, we understand received some attention in the, in the select committee's report is the continuing need for the chancellor's office and what its role would be. Um, and it's important in, in, in understanding that recommendation, the need to differentiate and recognize a real difference in what's needed to manage the day-to-day -day functions of institutions and what's needed for what we call at NCHEM as a policy leadership role. We think that the chancellor's office uh, is, is necessary to focus on policy leadership, which is the alignment to the state and student needs, uh, which is um, conducting the planning activities of the system to uh, engagement with employers and making uh, productive liaisons with other state agencies. And uh, in settings where the chancellor's office in other states, the equivalent of it, that is, or in uh, institutions that are singly attached, the outward focus of the policy leadership role often gets neglected in, in such cases when the day-to-day -day management requirements of the institution or the system are, uh, are overwhelming. And so uh, we, we view that to be particularly important in Vermont because it's uh, the, the inability to sort of define that, that path forward has been, I think, one of the reasons that you find yourself in this in this condition. And so the policy leadership role and the role of the chancellor's office also includes working on issues that fall between and among institutions, including issues like credit, rec credit recognition or the recognition of credit and transfers, uh, the general, a common general education core, things related to prior learning assessment, the development and delivery of online programming, Shared academic programming, which is a, a critical feature of the solution set that are, that's being presented in the select committee's report. Um, and then in addition, uh, the board, you all really need uh, capable data analysis and decision support, uh, particularly around ensuring the accountability of institutions to the board around finding efficiencies and maintaining them. I think I'll sort of stop there. Um, uh, I would, I think I'll stop right there and, uh, and I'm, I think Dennis and I, Dennis, let me ask you if you have anything else to add before uh, folks chime in with questions. No, given that we only have about another hour on our end, uh, better we spend our time responding to questions from the board members. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Go ahead, Janet. Oh, you're mute. Sorry, um, when you, looked at the model um, of the organization. Did you consider putting VTC with CCV given that that's a model that's used widely in other places and the extensiveness of their two-year programs? Well, let's start, let, uh, congratulations on starting with one of the most nettlesome questions that, uh, that, we, that we and the select committee have confronted. Um, VTC is, uh, it is not a unicorn in the world of higher education, but it is a, an institution of which there are relatively few direct comparable comparisons across the country uh, because of its, uh, its, the degree to which it's focused on both two and four, four year back, um, technical education programming. So we, we did wrestle with what, what, should, what we should do with BTC. The dilemmas related to BTC are that it has, in, in our judgment, it is, uh, one of the institutions that is uh, creating concerns about fiscal sustainability and on its own, it's likely not, and particularly in light of the demographic changes Vermont's likely to see, it is likely not a sustainable entity all on its own. So what we, uh, what we were thinking uh, it needed to do would be to be created as part of the unified institution in order so that those main those technical programs that it currently offers are maintained and preserved in a, in a strategy that will be up to you to sort of uh, create um, uh, the, the specific details around. But we offer some ideas related to creating a college of technology, for instance. And we also think that both NVU and Castleton could benefit from having their students 
have, rel have easier access to programming that's available at VTC, as well as uh, learn from the experience of VTC in delivering hands-on education, technical education, and workforce relevant education throughout the programs that are already in place at, at Castleton and NBU. So we're hopeful that there's a, a cross-pollination positive outcome associated with that as well. Um, and, and so that's the, that's the, those are the set of, uh, of, of reasons. Uh, it, um, maybe I just didn't understand, but um, did you actually look at putting it though? Is there a reason why it wasn't combined with CCV? I think that if you put VTC together with CCV, you're likely to create conditions in which the CCV uh, business model gets uh, disrupted and ultimately CCV becomes the the source of funding to help BTC get st get stood up on its on its right feet, and I don't think that that's the, in the long term best interest of the of the system. Is the big issue the high cost of providing some many of the VTC programs? I think that the big issue for VTC for that is VTC's got high cost for its programs. It's probably going to continue to have relatively high cost for its programs without changing some of the um, hands-on components of it. The bigger challenge in, in some respects is the extent to which VTC already has um, a physical plant that it needs to, to find some solutions to, as well as an, uh, a, collective, a set of collective bargaining agreements that um, are very different than what CCV has in place. When we uh, see institutions or systems that are brought together with very different um, personnel policies, it's generally the case that um, the personnel policies that are most advantageous to the personnel are the ones that become adopted. And that is um, a, an issue that would likely lead to greater costs for CCV and, and, and have a, have a long-term negative effect overall. Okay. Um, anyone else have any yeah. questions? Uh, we'll have Adam and then we'll have Ryan. Great, so uh, sort of following up on that, on page uh, 85 of the report, it references the comparatively high cost of benefits to other peer groups that you compared us to, um, I think 15% higher. Um, and then it goes on to explain that the resulting FTE expenditure difference um, is about $7,500. Uh, and then if you use that as a multiplier, you could uh, extrapolate almost $40 million in savings if you're able to reduce that to zero. Report then says that's unlikely to accomplish that. Let's use the 20 to $25 million number. So my, my question is in, in zoning in on that 20 to $25 million number, which is really, I think, a strong, a big piece of the savings that is expected from this, this proposal. How much of that is reliant on collective bargaining and how much is it, it could be achieved simply by through the consolidation, not reliant on collective bargaining? That's a, that's a good question. Let me start by saying that the $40 million and the $20 million you're talking about are a reference to fiscal year 18 data that we had to rely on because of uh, the availability of data for peer institutions. But certainly um, the chancellor's office, Sophie and her team have been very forthcoming with more recent data for VSC, but for us to, to try to identify comparators, we had to use other publicly available data. So we've got several years of, of uh, lagging going on. And of course there's this little thing called COVID that's happened in between. So uh, I would say that one of the reasons that the $40 million is unrealistic has to do with the very, change, the very changed conditions that we're talking about here. It's also the case that um, notwithstanding uh, the, the differences between what collective bargaining agreements exist between CCV and VTC, our intent has not been to, to, uh, to engage on whether or not collective bargaining is, but we assume collective bargaining would continue to be the defining way in which uh, Vermont State Colleges organizes its uh, labor agreements with the uh, with the institutions. And so um, the, the savings, as a, which is a term that we might want to be a little cautious about as well, because some of those might be redirected uh, 
funds redirected to better achieve student success or something like that, um, or, to, or to enhance affordability would come from creating greater efficiencies overall. And um, as part of that, one of the things that we suggested is that the, you all, the board, uh, should take a more active role in, in sorting out the, um, the degree to which the collective bargaining agreements have provisions that are sustainable or not, including such things as benefits. But, you know, I, let me let me follow up that, you know, in 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 the calculations, we presume that the collective bargaining agreements that are there now would stay in place. We are not uh, presuming savings out of changes in the collective bargaining agreement. This is saying collective bargaining through transformation and consolidation. Uh, only. So if I could just follow up on that for, for maybe the, for uh, um, the board and, and staff to really want to make sure that going forward, we understand is, you know, the way this report reads is it's, it's proposing that there's a 7,500 uh, expenditure per FTE that could be saved. That, that comes right after the reference to one example of why that may be, which is higher benefits. So, so long as our plan in which to ensure sustainability is built on something that we don't yet know if we can achieve vis-a-vis um, -vis some of the expenses. So just wanting to really make sure that this 20 to $25 million uh, is achievable. And if so, where is that coming from? So thank you for your answers. And, and, and also, you know, I think, <laughs> I think it's also true that while you have high benefit costs, you have lower than, than peer group numbers on faculty salary levels. Um, so you have a different compensation mix than some of your peer institutions. The savings come out of, you know, we look at it, um, you have just small class sizes, um, you have high, administrative costs per FTE in all of your institutions relative to what peers have. Um, that there's, what we're pointing out is that there are opportunities for consolidation um, that give you room to, to achieve savings. Okay. Um, so I have... Any more, Adam? We'll go to Ryan. Thank you. So yeah, um, I think the plan is very innovative and it's um, quite the large change we're looking at here. So I was curious to get your take on um, how successful you believe this plan will be and if there are any concerns you have regarding the plan and as we, if we were to move forward with it. Um, so any kind of change this, this substantial uh, carries with it, can, you know, some risk, but I think that you have to first off bear in mind that not taking these kinds of sweeping steps is not going to leave Vermont State Colleges in a good position at all. Um, I think that it's got uh, elements of, of some innovative thinking that I think more and more states are gonna have to look to to, to adopt. Um, as we've seen uh, in the news recently, a lot of other states are, are taking up the, the, the mantle of, you know, how are we going to uh, especially states in like Vermont that are facing a demographic challenge, how are we going to continue to offer the um, qual high quality post-secondary programming scattered throughout our state when we don't, when we may, when we've underfunded our institutions, we're facing a state budget crisis and we've got, uh, we've got a demographic decline uh, in, a, in the future. So um, academic program sharing, creating the conditions for these things, for incentives to, to do collaboration across more, campus, what are traditional campus boundaries, I think is part of the solution that's going to happen. As for concerns, I guess my gravest concern would be that the, the, the legislature fails to um, uh, provide the resources that are necessary for the state colleges to really fund the, act, fund the need to do this transformation and to give uh, sufficient time for the transformation to take shape and to, and to take root. Um, one of the things that we see in Vermont 
uh, that's different from some of the other places that we work is the, pre the, the high degree of, of relatively small employers uh, and, a, uh, and the, the lack of a, of, a, of a really unified and vocal business presence to pull the legislature along in partnership with the state uh, college system like VSC. And so um, that's one of the reasons that we've elevated the, the, the urgency point in this report um, and tried to encourage the legislature to really recognize that this is not something that they can allow to drift any further, that it didn't, that the Vermont State Colleges are in a worse condition than they, than they would be because of the pandemic, like all institutions all over the country. But the, but the problems predated the pandemic for multiple years and there needed, to be, there needed to be some real attention given to that. And so when one of, the, one of the things we've tried to do with our report is to really separate out the cost implications of COVID from, this, from what we're calling the structural deficit that's in, that would have been in place irrespective of the, of the cost of the pandemic in order to really point to the, point the legislature to the need to solve. I mean, they've got to, they've got to pay attention to the cost of COVID, of course. That was a real cost to the institutions, but the solving the COVID problem still leaves a structural deficit that, that must be addressed over, over time. And so uh, we, we are hopeful that the, that the report, and we, we understand that the report is receiving a lot of attention um, and, and there seems to be some uh, uh, good attention being given to it. But it's going to have that that attention and that and that need for urgency is going to need to be sustained, and we're and we're hopeful there's a there's the political will in the state to carry it forward. So we're grateful that the select committee has been so engaged because that's the found that's a foundation for a a group of individuals from different walks of life who have a real interest in the Vermont State Colleges being successful, who can help push the the conversation uh, beyond just the 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 present preparation of these reports. Are there any more questions? Uh, go ahead, Linda. Um, I guess I have two. My first one, I'd say that, um, and you just really addressed this. My biggest concern is, um, is the will or ability of um, a Vermont to in fact, fund a transition for, <laughs> I guess, four more years is what the plan is calling here, because we at least have funds for FY21 already. Um, and so I guess my biggest fear, I'm thinking of a comment I heard from Elaine about the NVU thing is that she, she, they felt like they, you know, they wanted this long to transition and they felt like they had half of that. And so I'm very concerned we might have to do this faster um, if we didn't get the kind of funding commitment we needed. Can that be done? <laughs> if we really had to, is it, it's my biggest fear. I, I think that, that I, I, I guess, you know, again, from, from quite a distance, right. uh, I guess I'm, I'm reassured by the seriousness and the, and, the, and the speed with which Sophie and her team have been trying to help move this conversation forward while the select committee is doing its work. There's been a real effort to try to keep the, the work that the chancellor's office has been doing with you all and with Jim Page in alignment with the select committee and in, in ways that are constructive and productive, I think. Yes. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that is uh, reassuring in part because it's reflective of the fact that there's no time to be to, to waste in solving, right. addressing some of these challenges. Now, I do think that, you know, that it, you cannot get to the end goal overnight in this process. It's gonna take some time and, and effort and funds. Um, and what we've tried to do in the most recent report you may have noticed is include some timeline milestones that 
are intended to sort of both reflect the urgency, but also give comfort to the legislators who are being asked to pony up a large substantial amount of money that there's a real um, set of milestones that the, that the Vermont State Colleges are going to need to meet that are sort of, they come from the select committee as an external entity, but are not completely unreasonable from the perspective of those folks who, who know what it takes to get this job done and who are gonna be held to account to get it done so that the funds are, are not held up because the, the, speed, the speed was inadequate. Okay, and I, my second, I guess, biggest um, concern has to do with the accountability. So I've been on this board for 15 years. Um, I would not say that, um, I don't think this board has done a good job on um, accountability um, over that period of uh, time. And some of it is because of the five strong colleges model and the silos that was the theme and the modus of, mode of operation for so long of it. And so we're in a different mindset. This whole plan is a very different mindset of that. Um, but you know, we also, so I'm just not sure the board often held management accountable enough. I think a lot of the time when the board tried, um, the silos and things caused a lot of uh, foot stonewalling, foot dragging, a lot of pushback or just a lot of not actually um, delivering or getting us back to us with the, the information that, that we um, wanted. We didn't do a good job of having strong benchmarks and then we didn't actually make sure and monitor strongly and well that benchmarks were met. It seems to me that's really a point you're making here is it's really critical. We're gonna to have to be able to do that. Um, so we need to also, we need to be better at it. We need to know how to be better at it. Um, how do we do that? How do we make sure it's different this time? Uh, that's a great question. And um, I, I don't wanna give you, I, I think that you're characterizing um, what we have, what we have uh, either drawn conclusions related to on our own, or have heard pe other people say about the about the Vermont State College Board. So, with that having said that, I think that that other uh, boards in other states facing similar uh, situations are. This is a, an era that's different in important yeah. ways. And boards are gonna are being asked to make bolder and more difficult decisions than they have in the past, and um, habits die hard. So uh, we did make some recommendations with respect to all of you and the kind of uh, board development activities that would be, I think, helpful. Um, and I think that I don't know to the degree to which Linda, your comments are shared by other members of the board, but. Uh, you are clearly, as a board, in for um, a lot of, of tough decisions, and you should equip yourselves with the kind of resources and support necessary to make those as much as possible. Um, and I would say that probably, regardless of the, the shape of the restructuring recommendations the select committee has made, um, or the plans that Sophie has, has been putting forward um, that are in alignment with that. There's just a real need for boards to, uh, to take on an appropriate role in providing oversight, setting direction, um, evaluating their own uh, behavior uh, in, in the context of uh, demographic decline and in a state where um, public funds have not been generous to support the enterprise. 
Brian, you know, in response to that question also, I just remind the board that, that anytime, and you're going through the process right now of setting priorities and goals, um, anytime you do that, you ought to make sure that there are some accountability metrics that sit right alongside those. Uh, so that uh, whatever the buzzwords that show up in the goal statements, and they tend to be things like access and affordability and responsiveness and uh, those kinds of things, that you be clear that you can describe how would you know if the system is any of those things, uh, that there are ways, you know, that that you use the <laughs> the accountability metrics as a way of signaling to the campus communities what you mean by those various terms, um, so that you can not only communicate meaning, but you can also, on the other end, monitor progress or lack thereof, um, and. You know, when I when I talk to boards, I say your job really is to establish the what is to be accomplished and to ask the question whether it was accomplished. The how it's accomplished is the responsibility of of the chancellor, the presidents and and their staffs, um, you know, that that's where they have to figure out the how's. Um, the, you know, your tools are, are limited in some ways as to, to what happens if not, uh, you still have the power of the purse as it applies to both leadership and institutions. Um, and you also have the ability to create certain expectations, which you have in the past around things like uh, transferability of credit, gen ed, some of those kinds of things, uh, you know, but that means that you not only set a set of expectations, but you set a timeline and say, we expect this to be done by this point in time. And we expect uh, progress reports quarterly or whatever the time frame you deem appropriate. Um, you know, that <laughs> it's really all about establishing a set of expectations and being clear about them and then consistently asking the question, how we do them. Anything else, Linda? No, thank you. Okay, Michael, you're next. Hi, Brian. Hi, Dennis. Thanks for being here uh, with us today. I just had a, a couple of questions. Maybe I'll ask them um, all at once and then um, let you uh, respond to them. <clears throat> I think are pretty specific. And then one of them is a broader question. Um, one of the things we've heard in the public comments is concerns about rebranding or preserving brand identity or value and um, particular campus brand. And I know you talked about that in the report and gave some examples and acknowledged in the short term, there can be some difficulties with branding. I hope that maybe you would talk a little bit about that um, and the downside of, of rebranding and how to manage that. You also in the opening comments mentioned that Vermont isn't doing as great of a job recruiting as some other states. Um, and I assume maybe you're refer maybe you're referencing high school graduates, but you may have been referencing other populations and wondered if you could just speak a little bit more to that as well. And then the, the broader question is, um, you know, if the funding is made available, if the recommendations are accepted, is this, you know, what are the other steps? What are the, are there things that the board, the system need to do in addition um, at some point down the road? Or is this, um, is this sort of enough in your opinion to move the needle toward a sustainable system? So I'll take the second one first. Uh, the, the reference that the, in the introduction I was making was to the degree to which Vermont as a state has, uh, and, um, has, has a bias toward serving 
traditional age college students with baccalaureate level education uh, more so than um, not certainly not all states, but it's it's heavy, it's got a heavier emphasis on that kind of education and training um, than many of the other states that we see. So part of the transformation, I think, is in terms of meeting students' needs and states' needs, is to think a little differently about the type of students that could benefit from education and training. Uh, there, there, Vermont Tech and CCV have a have you know they serve adult students. Um, they provide uh, uh, workforce um, connected training programs. BTC offers some non-credit programming that's 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 nimble. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that I think I was referencing there um, around recruitment. It has to do with broadening the 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 definition of students and the and the and the interpretation of the audience that can benefit from the work of the Vermont State Colleges beyond what traditionally uh, the state has done and what what comes easily to mind to the public and to legislators about who the students that are attending post secondary institutions are. Brian, um, yes. Let me on on that point. One of the points that we make pretty consistently that the committee makes pretty consistently is that Vermont is a, you know, is a pricey state in which to go to college, uh, that uh, affordability is an issue because uh, you graduate a very high proportion of your high school students, a very low proportion go on to college. And, you know, there's, a couple of reasons why that might be true, but one of the most obvious one is price. Um, and Vermont hasn't attended to affordability to the level that it needs to. And that's particularly true, affordability for adult part-time students. Uh, you know, the whole question about how you structure the payment of tuition and the broader costs of attendance for working adults um, is, has not been well attended in Vermont. So the, um, the first question, which was, which is now escaping me. On branding on the- Oh, on, on branding, the... yes. That, that is a, that, that's a, that's a, uh, an important issue. Um, I think that there are ways in which uh, what we've tried to suggest is that um, that brands and 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 uh, symbols and heraldry and all of that um, have meaning for folks that goes beyond just dollars and cents. Um, it also is something that uh, folks uh, may believe is is a the uh, key element in their outreach to student populations uh, that would subsequently enroll. Um, I think that there are thoughtful ways that the, I think that figuring out how to thoughtfully uh, undertake this integration and this transformation and preserve and integrate institutional identities is a, a significant consideration that the board and should um, be concerned about. Um, I don't think, I, I don't think that it's, um, the case that a single administrative entity, the single unified institution with a single accreditation necessarily means that in individual parts of the institution can't maintain their own distinctive identities in some respects. Um, as I said before, one of the ways that one of the areas we're most concerned about this occurring is because it's an instrumental thing is the um, insurance is the assurance that Vermont, what Vermont Tech does doesn't get washed away in the integration of the other institutions. And so we, we, we look for examples of, of places where things like that could be done effectively and offered a few in there. But one option is to, as I said before, is to sort of establish a college of technology that um, Vermont Tech sort of has a set of activities related to its, um, its historic role, but broadened within the context of this larger institution. Um, PASHI, the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, currently one of the places that's looking into consolidating institutions, multiple institutions is also wrestling with this issue. Um, and uh, 
you know, I, I think that it, it's important to, to recognize and honor those, those elements of brand and respect and um, his, history and heritage while not allowing them to overwhelm the, the reality that all three of the institutions that we are in the select committee are suggesting be unified have um, fiscal issues that need to be resolved. And, and so um, figuring out how to do that collectively will help them uh, and branding will have to be a, a, a part of that solution worked into the conversation but otherwise they'll likely separately not be viable in the long term. Anyone else? Okay, I uh, Bill, Bill Lippert, please. Yes, uh, I would appreciate if you would uh, review again and your thinking around the maintaining of a chancellor's office. This has been a point of controversy for some. And uh, if you'd say more about that. And okay, so if, we, if, if there are two institutions, CCV and a unified institution within the system, then uh, there needs to be a, an entity with responsibility for um, setting the direction, supporting the board, working with the legislature, working with the Agency on Education and the Agency on Community Economic Development, the Department of Labor, um, there likely needs to be a, uh, this is the organization that needs to monitor the, um, the, the uh, temperature uh, and the status of the employer community and, and ensure alignment of programming with those needs. Um, it's also, the uh, organization, the part of the organization that will stay on top of emerging trends in higher education um, and think about innovation and the application of innovative technology or te techniques and uh, like prior learning assessment um, and work to, to encourage their adoption and ensure their adoption across the, the two institutions. Um, the, these I think it's too easy to, we are not suggesting that the chancellor's office be larger than it currently is, but that its role be more focused on those sets of activities, generally speaking, while the administrative consolidation of the day-to-day -day management of the enterprises is, is, um, can, can it, is, is overseen by the chancellor's office, but the day-to-day -day work of that can be happening somewhere else. Did that answer your question? So in large part, it follows from, in part from the other structural recommendations of having, instead of having a single university. It's, so, it's that, but I, but I think there's also the, the other piece. Uh, and and um, that is that if, you know, <laughs> if there were, a single institution, if all, inst all campuses were merged into one, then what is traditionally the case, if you look at other states, other, other instances, the leadership of that enterprise becomes almost totally inward focused. I mean, it's about running the institution. And the part that links the institution to the state and the needs of the state get left out. That piece of policy leadership gets, it's very much put in second place in, uh, in the absence of an entity that has that broader policy leadership function as its primary agenda. And I think States that don't have that kind of entity and that kind of leadership are the worst for it. They get less out of their, they get less contribution from their higher education enterprises to the needs of the state rather than the needs of the institution. Thank you. Adam and then Karen. 
Yeah, uh, Brian, earlier uh, in our conversation, you, you mentioned that uh, Vermont has a high degree of small employers. Uh, and that really is causing a lack of, of just general outcry from the employers to pull the system along. Throughout the report, and, and this is um, for my fellow board members will know that, you know, uh, to me, it's music to my ears, a, a strong focus on some of the workforce aspects of this. Um, but throughout the report, it really seems to, to build on the opportunity to have a better engagement with employers for coming in for stackable credentials, um, for uh, associates degrees for certain um, demand-driven occupational needs. Did, did the committee or did you folks dig into trying to understand is that, is that possible given the fact that we have so many small employers when you look at the, the current demand projections, we, we see that they largely fall in healthcare and, and education in areas where the bulk of our large employers uh, cross over industries and sectors. Um, so I'm just curious if, if you've done any work there, I don't think it really influences our discussion or conversation um, going forward on a decision today, but having you here in front of us, I'd, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts on that. So I think that there's already cases where the the um, where where there are pockets of 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 good work being done around connecting uh, the small employers together through associations, the hospital association, or the uh, apprenticeship program that are that BTC is running with the plumbers and the electricians. Those are some cases that that I think are. Um, they provide some evidence of, 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 of attention to that that can, that can conceivably grow. Um, I, but I, I, I do think that, there, that, that more and more intentional efforts around that, uh, generally speaking, can be done. And I think we've made some references to all other elements that sort of fall alongside the scope of the select committee's work um, related to these things, including the really uncoordinated way adult career technical education happens in Vermont, for example, um, there's a role for Vermont State Colleges to play there. But in the legislature, I think in recognition of the fact that there's some challenges in that space, um, requested a report uh, a couple of years ago um, that has been tabled due to COVID. So we've encouraged the state to revisit that topic and to do so from the perspective of having state assets in place ready to figure out how to solve some of those challenges in the form of the Vermont State Colleges, for instance. Um, I think that I would also add that uh, when we work in states that are facing similar conditions as Vermont, declining dem demography, um, Wyoming is a state like this, they've got declining demography and they're entirely too focused on one industry. There is a need to try to spur entrepreneurship um, and I think that this, again, there again, the state college system, as well as the university, are real assets in trying to help provide the linkages to education and training that can help small businesses get off the ground and then grow um, and can help, you know, help us start to address some of those issues related to uh, the economic future of the state as well as the demographic future of the state. So I think that that's kind of a little bit um, uh, of a, of a, of a smorgasbord of an answer to your question. Um, I, but I, I do think that, you know, working with large employers is key to this, working with try, and trying to figure out ways in which you can bring groups of small employers together and make it easy for them to engage with the state college systems is the way to, to, to go forward on this path. Yeah, this, you know, Brian mentioned, you used the word associations and, uh, you know, we've, we've worked in other states where it's worked really well to work with, you know, the, the auto dealers association, the hotel restaurant group association, all of which represent typically what we would call smaller employers, um, where you can't necessarily do it one employer at a time, but you can work with them collectively because they tend to have common needs. So, uh, you know, it's a matter of intentionality and, and, uh, and 
kind of working diligently to find out where they are, who they are, and, and uh, how to put together a collective, a response to a collective need. Thank you both. Karen. Um, I have questions about two different things. Um, one is a follow up and there's been some lead into this about uh, you didn't talk about tech centers and high schools, but you alluded. And in the report, there's some reference and there's a statement made that this of course isn't part of the charge but in your research, it would appear to me, and I happened to listen in to um, a meeting or meetings of the select committee where you kind of went in that direction and then you said, well, that's not our focus, so we're gonna stop. I'd like you, and I recognize that that's part, that that was not part of the focus of the select committee, but I believe that if we're talking about affordability of public education in the state of Vermont, that by necessity, somebody's got to, it, somebody's got to be involved with um, uh, helping to forge a holistic vision of public higher education and secondary education. And I'm hoping that this may be a springboard since we have a larger audience than usual right now. And because we have the attention of the legislature and the governor's office, so even though it was not the charge of this committee, of the select committee and you folks, I'm hoping that you can talk for just a second about the opportunities that you saw there that we're not taking advantage of, that we need to take advantage of, if for no other reason, affordability and broadening the base of the service, of our service net. The second issue, and this has been touched upon by a handful of people, and I'm very concerned about this as well. The focus has been, a, a good part portion of the focus has been on um, workforce development. And that of course is very important, especially in a small state with a declining population. Um, but some folks have raised the issue of what about liberal arts? The quality of liberal arts, you can't have a democratic society without a strong liberal arts base. And while everybody in Vermont isn't going to attend the VSC, so we can't control liberal arts for all, how do you see us again feeding into a public education continuum with our partners at the secondary level and perhaps beyond in producing an educated populace that has re respect for uh, democratic ideals. So it's a pair of really good questions. Um, I think on the on the on the issue of the liberal arts discussion, we certainly um, uh, have have talked about the trying to strike the right balance between this uh, theme around workforce development and meeting employer needs, and the the theme that you are citing around uh, developing. Uh, a, a, a citizenry that's engaged and capable of, you know, uh, maintaining a, a peaceful and civil society, and among other things. I think part of it is that there's a, a, a false dichotomy between workforce development and liberal arts as though liberal arts is not contributing in any meaningful way to the needs of the workforce, when in fact, uh, there is, I think, ample evidence uh, that the, the skills and, 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 and knowledge that you gain in some of those programs are very, are, are very uh, appropriate to the advancement of careers and, and so forth and so on. Um, we have tried to be a little bit sensitive to, the, to that by suggesting a couple of things. One is that, um, the, that the, liberal, the, the, the delivery of liberal arts could be a little more intentional about the kinds of skills that would help ensure students with, deg with, with degrees in, let's say, English or history like I have, are able to be uh, capable of, of, of entering a, a, a job shortly after college because there's been the integration of certain workforce relevant skills in the, into, that, into that liberal arts curriculum as well. So for example, technical writing as part of, of, a, of an English uh, program. Um, 
so there's so there's that piece. Um, on the question, Dennis, do you want to add anything to that before I go down the path to the uh, other one? Well, regard to the, with regard to the liberal arts, we spent a lot of time talking about that uh, with the select committee. I, I would just add a couple of other points, one of which is that the liberal arts programs and departments in the, in the three institutions in particular are, are very small and um, in a lot of ways not large enough to really offer students the kind of liberal arts education you'd hope they get. Uh, so by combining institutions, you also create a critical mass of faculty in, in these departments um, in ways that strengthen the, the programs themselves. So I think you have the, the combined institution offers an opportunity to strengthen those programs just because of the ability to get to critical mass. Um, I would follow up Brian's point also is that one of the <laughs> one of the things that I would note in in Vermont is it's not a state that's big on using data in decision making. Um, you know that it's it tends to be anecdotal rather than data based and etc. But one of the things that we've seen in some other states is when you see the kind you know when you have when you have systems in place that let you understand the kinds of jobs into which liberal arts graduates go post-graduation um, and start seeing that, you know, if, if they're <coughs> uh, psychology um, student, but they all end up in advertising or communications or one of those kinds of jobs that you understand that there's a way to put in one or two courses in a, in a liberal arts program that really helps them in what comes next. And uh, the absence of those kinds of data mean that uh, you know, the quality of the program judged from the point of view of outsiders is not as good as it could be. Um, and I've had uh, legislators, you know, we got engaged in a, in a major conversation a few years ago about what's quality in higher education and how do you define quality? <coughs> and a state legislator put it, I think about as well as I've, I've heard it stated, and, and he said, you know, quality is good preparation for what comes next. Um, and that means that quality in higher education is externally referenced, not internally referenced. Uh, and it means it's, it's judged by employers, it's judged by uh, faculty and institutions to which students transfer Etc. You know, quality in third grade is judged by teachers in the fourth grade. Um, so, I think that there are ways to strengthen liberal arts, their applicability, and at the same time recognize these folks are all going to work someplace. Let's make sure that they get not just the the broad skills, but they have the tools to enter the workplace in a way that that uh, lets them be successful. Pardon, pardon the speech of fine. On the second, on the first question, which is we made that we turned into the second answer. Um, uh, the the issue of CTE and adult AB or what you call AEL, I believe. Um, that's an issue that we did raise with the select committee. Um, there are other entities involved beyond the, the state college system. There are uh, funding complications that need to be sorted out. Um, and I think that uh, ultimately the, the, 
the an attempt to really sort of tackle that as part of the select committee's uh, vocal focus areas was beyond the the likelihood of being successful without a, without further study focused on that particular issue. But I think that it's that that the select committee, uh, you know, and, and and us when we look at it, we think that it's something that is not working very well in Vermont and deserves some attention and needs to be raised. And so that's where the select committee sort of came down on that topic. Lynn, I, I would just like to say, when I heard that and saw that in writing, I couldn't have been happier. Um, I, think that, I think that that issue, not just the tech centers, but the high schools as well, need to be working in tandem with public higher education in order to produce affordable quality results in this state. And I'm hoping that we will finally get the attention of all the silos and the legislature and the governor's office to move those issues ahead. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Oh, Jenica, you go first. I guess my, I just had a couple of comments. One is about the large employer. Um, I guess I would suggest having worked for the really big one that I don't think it's an issue of um, not having large employers uh, weighing in on our legislature. Uh, we don't have a legislature that in my personal experience has been responsive to for-profit business. I do think that coming up with a way that doesn't involve every association and every college reaching out to employers is gonna be really critical. If that can't be lean and mean, it's not gonna be effective. When companies are really small and you have maybe an HR person or maybe one HR person, you just don't have the um, bandwidth or the resources to connect with the college system and um, while my personal experience with the college system has been very good uh, when I've accessed them um, or when they've reached out, it can be a lot of doors that are opened to you or people asking. So I, I do think however we frame that going forward is going to be really important that it's just got to be really light on its feet um, and, and how we deal with that. Um, I do think there's an opportunity in terms of creativity to, to build on what um, Karen said. I still think the senior year of Vermont high school should be mostly taken care of by the Vermont college system. And that not looping that in as part of a strategy is probably a missed opportunity um, given how few courses many of our college seniors even have to take. Um, and it, it's just a, it's a very large waste of money on the K-12 side that would be better served in the state college side. Um, so I think that's a, I think that's a recommendation that would have huge total value to the state, um, not just the state college system. And can I just, Janet, you were, you're mentioning high school, high school seniors, weren't you, not college seniors? Yes. Correct. High school seniors. When, right. when we have situations where the majority of our high school seniors have completed all of their academic requirements right. by their senior year and they're sitting there needing like one more English and a PE, it's a way it's such a waste. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned it because I think you said college seniors. So mm -hmm. thank you. Lynn, I'm going to go to Jim Maslin and we'll go to Mary. Yeah. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for your report and your work on this. I've got... Um, a, a comment and a question. Um, I'll begin with what Janet and and um, others have said about um, the 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 gap, should we call it, between high school seniors and Vermont State Colleges. You know the the wide disparity that we've heard for years on the number of students who graduate high school um, versus those that go on to higher education, and the gap is huge, and it's been around for quite a while. So I'm wondering, and this is outside the scope of your work but an interesting question is there there's there's two ways to ask this question um do high school students value um or, or excuse me recognize the value of a continuing education at any of the vermont state colleges 
Um, do they recognize it in a, in, and aside from the affordability question? And the other way to ask that is, is there something odd about the way Vermonters perceive high school as, a, as an end in itself, rather than a step um, on to higher education, which clearly would be my, my um, very strong preference, of course. Um, is it that, that many high school seniors and their parents uh, see a high school diploma as an end in itself, rather than as a part of a uh, continuation for a life plan? And I recognize this, this is outside the realm of what you're asked to look at, but it struck me as as the um, conversation has gone on this afternoon that there's a there's a big hole there that we need to look into. And if you have comments at this time or any other time, I'd appreciate them. Thank you. Uh, I would just I would just refer you to the work that's being done by the Vermont Student Assistance Support, uh, Commission related to uh, surveying of high school seniors. And I think that there's some questions and some insights that may be drawn from that from that work. Um, I do think that the affordability issues in Vermont are, are pretty si significant um, as well. And, uh, but, but I think VSAC's got some information that you might find useful on that front. Well, I could start with, with VSAC, of course, but I think that is a much bigger question there than has been addressed or acknowledged or answered. Thank you. Mary. So as someone who spent my career in public education, high school, and tech ed, I want to make a couple of comments. I'm sure you guys all know this, but I want to make a couple of observations that every program in a tech center has a, an advisory committee of the particular area. So if it's a medical program, they have folks in the medical center, if it's automotive, et cetera, et cetera. Every program has a regional advisory committee of that industry. And a lot of the relationships that are developed in those committees lead to recruitment and placement of our kids coming out of the tech center. As well, we work very closely with BTC and CCV in terms of continuation. Um, you know, the senior year can be less vigorous in some schools because of other opportunities kids have taken. A lot of our schools are, are developing programs like our, our YES plan here in Rutland to, to assuage that and to give kids more opportunities. VSEC is very important and is very, very effective. And I, I would commend that to anyone who's not familiar with it. And the other thing some of the folks in this group have heard me say before is we have so many first generation kids. Mm -hmm. And you know we know from research that families start to decide about post-secondary education in fifth and sixth grade. And for a lot of these families, letting a child, a young person go off to college means the potential income that that person contributes to the family. We think about this as a farm-based issue. You don't want to let them go because you need them to work on the farm. But that's true in the, in the families here in our community where we need Johnny to stay in the house. We don't want him to spend money on rent. We need his income to help support the family. So it's a really much more complex issue than one might realize. Um, and I know that here in, in Castleton, uh, Jonathan has started a regional advisory team of, of businessmen and leaders to talk with Castleton. And I'm sure that's true in some of the areas. So the articulation between secondary ed and higher ed is more vigorous than some people may realize, but I'd be more than glad to bring any suggestions back to the regional soups um, as a result of this work. Thank you. Uh, Megan. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I wonder if this question of how we, you know, maybe expand our focus to um, high school students based, Mary, on the complexity that you've outlined and the opportunity, Janet, that you've outlined is something that maybe we take up in committee at a later date and just would ask the question, is there space within the recommendations? If, if we take the recommendations as they are from the select committee, can we then, is there space to then push this forward into other areas um, in the future? Megan, I'm not sure if you're addressing that question to us or to the to your colleagues. Sorry, maybe it's, it's, I guess the question, Brian, to you is, is your report, do we really view your report as the scaffolding for how we go forward? And then my question to you, um, Lynn would be, is this a particular topic that we resolve today or we table to discuss further in committee? 
Well, I'll answer my part. I don't think it's something we can discuss today, not because we don't think it's valuable. Um, I think that certainly Epsil may want to take that on as well, long range planning. And, and yes, I do think that the report that we, that we, that we helped craft with, uh, with your help and the other members of the select committee is the scaffolding under which um, the Vermont State College's purpose is better articulated. And, um, and then, then, then there, it, it creates the conditions in which Vermont State College's board can act in, in appropriate directions. But it also perhaps gives the legislature um, and, the, and the executive branch a sense of, of where it makes most sense to try to bridge those gaps and transition points in ways that are um, mutually reinforcing. Jim, are you still interested in asking a question or is that a leftover hand? It's a leftover hand, but I think Megan's approach is a good place to start. Thank you. Thank I'll you. take my leftover hand out. Okay, anyone else? I have a question. One of the things that well, there's a bunch of things that, that people have indicated to us. Um, did your committee or did your financial analysis include any, any overview of doing nothing? I know that Jim Page and his group with the treasurer's office and JFO did do an examination of our financial statements and our situation back in May. And I'm just wondering, it did the select committee do any examination of status quo? And if so, what, what analysis do you suggest is included in that? So the, what we did was reviewed what, uh, and tried to uncover what was done to better understand what the cost of doing nothing would be. Um, doing nothing would, uh, I think, lead you back into a similar uh, position that, that um, that the Vermont State Colleges found themselves in a year ago uh, that led to the aborted this recommendation to close three campuses. Um, I think that it's very likely that in the absence of change uh, and, and resource investment on the part of the legislature to support that change, that, the, that, your, that this board will have to consider whether or not it can maintain a presence in all of the locations that it currently operates. Uh, and that's a question that, that at least in some cases, there may be some more um, efficient ways to manage some of the uh, operations, say, that are separately being run in, the, in, in nearby locations by BTC and CCD, perhaps. But generally speaking, as I said at the outset, we've been trying to articulate the, I think, a fairly compelling set of reasons why the the, the major campuses of the institutions are where they are, um, and that there are both there are political, there are economic, there are opportunity, there are uh, uh, actual fiscal related uh, reasons to maintain those places where they where they currently are in some form or fashion, but with transformation, uh, making some changes in those those things. But to get more closer to the answer to your question, Representative Dickinson, is that we. Uh, we did gather information on the uh, estimated costs of, of closing campuses that were baked into the proposal in April to do that, as well as some other uh, data that we were able to track down. Um, the cost of closing the three campuses was estimated in April at $19 million over a couple of years. When we look at that, we think that's, um, it, that's a very optimistic set of costs to close those three campuses because it assumed that the, uh, the existing spaces would be able to be unloaded within a very short amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. And it didn't count for a whole, whole bunch of other additional costs. So uh, ultimately closing the campus is gonna have substantial costs. Those costs won't be supported by the, the tuition revenue that gets generated by the places that are being um, identified for closure. Uh, and then the impact on the communities and on the students being served will be substantial it will lead to additional costs of trying to teach out the students that are that are affected, uh, and it will close off an, an avenue for um, economic mobility and opportunity for the students uh, that students like those that are that that are, attend that institution. 
So for instance, um, if NV, NVU was one of the ones that was on the, on the table, that's the only uh, a baccalaureate degree granting set of programs in that part of the state. And there are very likely students who attend that institution that would otherwise not go to college in the absence of being able to, to go to NVU. So there are direct costs, there are indirect costs, there are spiritual costs, there are, there's the cost of the community, uh, and you can't, you can't quantify all of them, but at a minimum, there, there's, at a very minimum, we, we would expect that $19 million would be uh, the, the bill to just close, uh, you know, those three campuses that were on, on the cutting, on the chopping block in April. At least that much. Yeah, and we, like I said, I think it would be, I think that was optimistic. Okay, is there anyone else that has any, Adam, go ahead, do you have a question? Yeah, sorry, no. just as follow up, I noted that in the, in this report, we're now showing, I think it's, it's either 12 or 17 million for the consolidation of facilities uh, over several years. Was there, so is there a difference between the expense for the, the reduction of footprint versus the closure of a campus, and what data led you to use those numbers per year? Was there anything in that, or is that just sort of a placeholder? So we don't have the the, the super detailed data on the um, the cost of renovating our closure, and certainly it wouldn't be the select committee's purview to make decisions about um, which campuses or which buildings or whatever. What we did do was. Uh, worked with the chancellor's office to understand what the carrying costs of, in, of, of underutilized institutions are from one year to the next and relative to the costs of, of uh, repurposing or possibly even demolishing some buildings. And generally speaking, it's gonna be, it, it's, it'll vary by, by, camp, by the type of structure it is, but generally speaking that demolishing a, uh, at least some of the buildings that were, on, uh, that were on the list that we were provided with would um, have a have a cost that was roughly two to two and a half times the amount of money that the, that building costs to run in a given year. So in other words, it would pay off within two to three years if that building is no longer useful. But like I said, it's going to it's going to be very different based on the building, whether it's got asbestos and, and other factors. One of the other things with regard to facilities is in the in the financial plan that's put forth there is funding for ongoing renewal and renovation of facilities that keeps your deferred maintenance problem from getting any worse there's there's a cost estimate in there that says in order for the state to maintain its investment in the facilities it's already paid for there's an ongoing cost that they haven't been ponying up uh, and uh, there's just in the interest of just strategic finance from a, from the board perspective, there's a requirement to put ongoing funding into facilities and other institutional assets that haven't been attended to, um, and that those costs need to get recognized going forward. Bill. Well, I, I just want to, uh, maybe this sounds defensive as a legislator, but uh, in some of the conversation, there seems to be a shorthand in terms of the resources that need to be provided, that it's the legislature that needs to provide the resources when, in fact, the resources are needed over a period of years now. And mm -hmm. it's really going to require the legislature and the executive branch jointly to provide these resources. And I think it's really important that we not fall into the shorthand of not including both. Um, and we would agree. Anyone else? Well, it's just about an hour and a half um, that we have allotted for this conversation. And I appreciate you gentlemen coming here and giving us this up to date. Uh, overview and answering our questions. It's been very helpful. Um, we obviously have a lot of work to do and I appreciate the time you've put into it. Thanks very okay. much. Thanks for your time.
Thank you. And now we go to the chancellor who will present her transformation proposal. All right. So the Vermont State College system changes the lives of thousands of students each year by opening the door to higher paying jobs and an improved quality of life for themselves, their families and their communities. The Vermont State College's mission states, for the benefit of Vermont, the Vermont State College system provides affordable, high quality, student-centered and accessible education, fully integrating professional, liberal and career study, consistent with student aspirations and regional and state needs. To deliver on the mission, the Board of Trustees recently adopted a set of strategic priorities. In doing so, the Board committed to achieving success acting as a fully integrated system that achieves financial stability in a responsible and sustainable way and ensures equitable access to and completion of a quality post-secondary education for all Vermonters, including those who've been marginalized or underrepresented historically. The board's four strategic priorities are affordability, which is defined to mean that cost and debt are not barriers to access for students. Accessibility, which means that all Vermont students, including adult learners, will have a supported pathway to meet their educational goals, regardless of their financial means, rural geography, college readiness, or technology broadband internet access. And then quality and relevance of academic programs, for students, expectations of value include the ability to pursue their chosen educational path, a positive return on investment in the cost of pursuing a particular program relative to expected earnings, successful preparation for external evaluation such as licensure exams, and preparation for lifelong career and personal success in our global 21st century. For Vermont, expectations of value include quality programs that are aligned with state workforce needs, that are offered in a fiscally responsible manner and delivered in ways relevant to today's students and employers' needs. To meet its mission and these strategic priorities, the Vermont State College system must make students its top priority, providing the support services and technologies to ensure that success and deliver collaborative educational programs and services that are responsive to the needs and interests of students and employers throughout the state to operate as a responsive, fully integrated administrative system under strong aligned leadership that actively serves the needs of students and the people of Vermont by promoting efficiency, innovation, and collaboration. And finally, be positioned to deliver these outcomes on an ongoing, sustainable basis in a severely challenging demographic, economic, and competitive landscape. Achieving these outcomes requires the Vermont State College system and the state to undertake genuinely transformative change. Cultural change internally as the Vermont State College system becomes an integrated high-performing organization that measures its success in terms of student and state success, coupled with a change in how the Vermont State College system is funded by the state. With respect to funding, the Select Committee has proposed and the Vermont State College system is working to obtain necessary funding from the state to address the structural deficit and COVID related expenses, the cost of transformation and a permanent increase in base funding to enable the Vermont State College system to operate in a financially responsible and sustainable way into the future. For fiscal year 2022, the Vermont State College system is seeking $67.4 million. This includes the historic base appropriation an increase in base funding, funding to address the structural deficit plus $8 million in transformation expenses. In developing the transformation proposal, we were guided by three questions. Does it meet the needs of students? Does it meet the needs of the state? And does it contribute to the Vermont State College System's financial sustainability? As we've heard, the Select Committee on the Future of Public Higher Education in Vermont was created by the legislature to assist the state of Vermont in addressing the urgent needs of the Vermont State Colleges and to develop an integrated vision and plan for a high quality, affordable and workforce connected future for public higher education in the state. The Select Committee's proposed recommendations chart a path forward that answers each of these three questions. In addition, given the significant funding ask, the Vermont State College system is best positioned to secure the additional state investment it requires if its transformation is aligned with the recommendations of the Select Committee. 
In making this proposal, we acknowledge and appreciate the many contributions made by our stakeholder communities and the diversity of perspectives that were provided to and considered by the select committee in preparing their report as well. You're back. Sophie? Jen, can anyone hear? Here we are. Jen? Yeah, I'm here. We seem to have lost Sophie. Yes. Hey, hey Lynn, I think there was a power surge or something, and I don't know if anybody else had that in Chidney. Or I'm in Wodeyski, but maybe you should. Yeah, we out. had it here. We had it here, too. Should we go out and try to come back in? No. Why don't we give her just a moment? Okay. Yeah. Let me just check something. I don't think we had a power surge, but the computer went black. There we are. She's back. Jen, do you want to suggest that Sophie go out and come back in? That might help. Logging in on her phone now. Okay. There she is. When she's on her phone. There was a surge throughout. We felt it here in Montpelier as well. might say it seems to at least acknowledge the uh, circumstances under which we're all trying to do this work, <laughs> that we are not able to be in person, that we're reliant on being remote and totally reliant on uh, technology to help us do that. Good reminder. So Sophie is attempting to log back in. She doesn't have uh, sound right now. So um, just hold on for one moment. I hear lots of beeps. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, apologies. I, my internet just went out at the worst possible time. It, ha it happened all over, Sophie. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah. We only lost you, but we did get a surge all over. I, I would, I could suggest if anyone was uh, open to this is we could take a five to 10 minute break here because it has, we have been on for two hours. So just throw it out there and get it together. Great. Thank you so much. That's, that's up to you, Chair Dickinson, but just throwing that out. We could do that and we'll come back in 10 minutes. My clock says quarter of three. So let's be back by five of three. Excellent. Right. I don't know if Jen is back or anyone else, but why don't we go through it and start off where you left off? Okay. Yeah, so I was just talking about the public input that's been received and, and the board itself has also received um, extensive public comment on the future of the Vermont State Colleges, including presentations last summer to the Long Range Planning Committee by the Vermont State College Labor Task Force and VSCS Thrive, as well as a report and recommendations from the VSC Forward Task Force. 
Uh, the board has also received around 200 written comments through the link on the VSC website, individual emails and letters, and all of the public feedback will be made available at the transformation tab on the VSCS website. In addition, a student forum was held last Monday to receive feedback from students, and the board held a two-hour public listening session on Wednesday evening. So moving forward, as, as recommended by the Select Committee, the proposal for transformation um, is centered on an overall organizational structure for two complementary institutions with significant administrative consolidation. The president of each institution would report to the chancellor and the board of trustees would oversee the chancellor, the presidents and the two institutions. The proposal is based on three key concepts. Student access is our singular focus, education for life in a lifetime and Vermont is our community. So student success is our singular focus. We're committed to delivering the higher education and continuing education Vermont and Vermonters need while preserving the high touch personalized approach and close knit communities that the Vermont State College system is known for. We seek to better serve students where they are with a learning modality that works for them on a schedule that works for them with the courses, programs and credentials, both credit bearing and non credit bearing that provide them with the skills they need to attain their life and career goals and at a price they can afford. The Vermont State College system of the future will rely on a regular evaluation of program relevance, quality and sustainability to focus on continuous improvement of academic program offerings with the goal of ensuring Vermonters continue to have access to affordable programs that meet students' needs. This work will require thoughtful evaluation of the trade-offs between quality, access and sustainability, as well as sustained innovation of flexible delivery models for academic programs and essential student support services in order to increase access and success to a greater diversity of students across the state. With respect to education for life in a lifetime, we provide a comprehensive experiential education that prepares students for the jobs and careers needed to grow Vermont's economy, as well as for participation and enrichment of a democratic and civil society. We create opportunities for Vermonters at every point in life, from early college and dual enrollment programs for high school students, to degrees and credentials of value for working adults and those seeking to upskill and reskill. A renewed focus on the educational needs of Vermonters of all ages, coupled with the needs of employers for skilled employees, is fully compatible with maintaining high quality liberal arts programming. The term workforce relevancy incorporates the liberal arts and recognizes that these programs impart skills that are highly valued in the workplace, such as communications and problem solving. And they also prepare students for a less specific set of occupations. Vermont is our community and our rural public institutions provide crucial educational and employment opportunities to local residents serve as economic, social, and cultural anchors in their host communities, and help to educate workers in high demand local industries. The Vermont State College system of the future will maintain a physical presence in its current locations, but with a reduced physical footprint by selling, leasing, or demolishing underused physical facilities. This includes repurposing spaces for use by third parties, willing to enter into leasing arrangements, and for converting spaces for innovative uses capable of helping to fuel local economic development activities. Preference will be given to uses that provide students with opportunities for experiential learning or are otherwise part of an intentional academic strategy to cultivate entrepreneurial initiatives. This also includes reimagining residential experiences for students, as well as relocating staff in the chancellor's office to the campuses or providing them with the continued ability to work remotely. It's well recognized that the Vermont State College system needs to function as a consolidated system rather than as a confederation of institutions in order to realize the benefits of scale and to overcome the habits of history. Consolidated and modernized administrative services add value through cost reductions, improved service for students and employees and workable solutions to common problems. Consolidation and modernization of administrative services includes the development and enforcement of a standardized set of policies and procedures for services system-wide, with delivery of services both in-person and virtually. Although functions may be centralized, this does not mean physical centralization in the chancellor's office. Instead, functions may be centralized on individual campuses 
where there's particular expertise or where such expertise in a particular area can be created. Several of the areas that will be consolidated or have improved consolidation include procurement, financial aid, registration, admissions, marketing, information technology, and human resources. To be successful, transformation will require strong vision and leadership, disciplined project management, establishment of relevant success metrics, exceptional change management, and collaboration among all stakeholders. Although the breadth of transformation proposed is revolutionary, we can build on our experience with the unification of Johnson and Linden. The leadership, faculty and staff of NVU have demonstrated, for example, that a brand, a new brand and vision for education in rural communities can be developed while honoring the proud traditions and identities of individual institutions and programs. In addition, our faculty and staff have risen successfully to meet the challenges created by the pandemic delivering education in new ways grounded in robust learning outcomes, collaborating and designing a single general education curriculum, all with a committed, demonstrated commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Transformation is an enormous undertaking that will require substantial time and money. If supported by additional funding from the legislature, the transformation will position the Vermont State College system to evolve and adjust to the disruptive forces confronting higher education nationally to become financially sustainable, to provide greater access to education to an increasingly diverse range of students at an affordable price, to continue to be economic engines in the rural parts of the state, to serve as social, economic, and cultural anchors in host communities, and to play a critical role in meeting Vermont's future workforce needs. Preliminary work to map out the work ahead is shown on this slide. More details are contained in the transformation proposal itself, but some of the highlights include the creation of a single accredited university. In order to have the combined entity up and running by the fall of 2023, we will need to launch a national search for a president this summer with the expectation that the president will be in place by January 1st, 2022. The president of the combined entity will have 18 months to oversee the substantive change process, development of the government's processes and transformation of the three separate institutions into a single accredited institution by July 1 of 2023. The presidents of Castleton, Vermont Tech and Northern Vermont University will continue to lead the operations of their individually accredited institutions until the effective date of the accreditation change. With respect to academic programs, work on the ac appropriate academic program array for a combined Castleton University, Northern Vermont University and Vermont Technical College has grown out of the work undertaken by Castleton and NVU in the fall to address duplicate programs, as well as the ongoing work on a single general education core. The Vermont State College system has already contracted with RPK Group and will be working closely with the academic deans and with the faculty on this project. In addition, work is underway to expand the successful Hartness Library model at CCV and Vermont Tech to create a system-wide virtual library. With respect to administrative consolidations, administrative transformation benchmarking and planning will begin immediately in the areas of grants accounting, administration, procurement, collections and accounts receivable. By the fall of 2021, the Vermont State College system will begin implementation efforts regarding these key areas. Work on the previous consolidation of payroll and benefits will continue. In addition, recognizing the long lead time necessary for recruiting students, the admissions, financial aid, and marketing teams across the three colleges will work together to create the brand, marking materials, and financial aid strategies for the new combined institution. Admissions recruiting for the new institution will start in the fall of 2022, while each institution will continue to operate separately until July 1 of 2023. Information technology is critical as it undergirds everything we do and work on a strate strategic plan for information technology and development of a system-wide help desk is already underway. In addition, IT Council is already working on developing and implementing a new portal that will offer an improved user experience for students, faculty, and staff. One critical area regarding IT that needs to be finalized is the need for the architecture of the current enterprise resource planning system to be redesigned to support administrative transformation and increase capacity for data reporting. The decision of whether to undertake this concurrent with the creation of a new university will be finalized as part of the IT roadmap process. 
Workforce development and continuing education. Uh, the Vermont State College system recognizes that it must focus on the needs of Vermont and Vermont students for increased sub-baccalaureate degrees and non-degree certificates and credentials. To that end, there'll be one Director of Workforce Development to serve as a single point of contact system-wide for workforce development and continuing education programming. Accordingly, a business plan and a redesigned business processes will be developed during academic year 21-22 for a full launch by July 1 of 2022. Work on the physical transformation of the Vermont State Colleges began in FY 2020. This work will continue with the identification of underutilized assets. These underutilized assets will be evaluated for conversion to other academic uses, renovation for use as part of public-private partnerships or working in learning communities, sale or demolition. We also plan to move out of 575 Stonecutters Way when the current lease term ends in the summer of 2022. With respect to project and, change, project and change management, if the board approves the proposed resolution, detailed transformation planning will begin immediately with the issuance of a request for proposals for an individual or firm to establish a project management office. The director or consulting firm in charge of this function will be responsible for supporting all transformation efforts, establishing clear measures of success, providing disciplined project management approaches and practices, offering guidance and expertise regarding organizational change and will regularly report progress to the Chancellor and the Board of Trustees. The Select Committee's report includes a schedule for reducing the Vermont State College System structural deficit over a five-year period of transformation, which is dependent on additional state investment in the significant work and cost of transformation and ongoing investment in the Vermont State Colleges to improve its capacity to meet the needs of students and the state's goals. The work of transformation will require the development of a strategic financial plan and careful monitoring of financial benchmarks. This strategic focus on the financial plan for the system builds on action already taken by the board in August 2020 to adopt a new system, a new approach to system-wide budget development. To be clear, this transformation timeline is not set in stone, but will likely evolve once project management is underway. It does set forth an ambitious timeline, but one that we believe can be met assuming the Vermont State College system receives the necessary funding from the legislature. NETCHI approves the proposed changes and there is no worsening of the pandemic or some other un unanticipated event. The Board of Trustees is responsible for acting in the best interests of the system and has a fiduciary responsibility to protect the public assets of the VSC, which includes its finances as well as its reputation and role in the community. As such, it is responsible for approving major decisions reviewing transformation progress and checking that benchmarks are being met. This slide shows the board's key decision points in connection with transformation over the next five years. Transformation will take substantial time and money, and it's no secret that the Vermont State College system has limited bench depth across the entire organization. Folks are stretched thin with people wearing multiple hats and juggling many responsibilities. Thus, the Vermont State College system lacks the capacity to absorb the costs involved in such a significant transformation and adequate resources will be required. The Vermont State College system estimates that transformation will require approximately $20 million over four years as shown on this slide. We have already requested 8 million in transformation costs for FY22 from the legislature. This slide shows a number of critical success factors that have been considered along with proposed mitigation strategies. Some of the factors upon which a successful transformation hinge include ongoing support from the state, approval of accreditor and department of education, that the pandemic is under control, that the Vermont State College system is able to achieve $5 million in cost savings and or additional revenue each year. By acknowledging the critical success factors, we can identify and pursue mitigation strategies. So for example, we're working closely with the governor and legislative leaders on the, on the funding. We will seek an advisory opinion from NETCHI prior to submitting a, a substantive change request, and we will confirm the acceptability of the proposed restructuring with the US Department of Education. We will continue to monitor the pandemic and work closely with the governor's team and the Department of Health and we will be developing a strategic financial plan and report progress periodically to the board. So in conclusion, I'm recommending that the board approve resolution 2021-007, 
on the transformation of the Vermont State College system, authorizing the chancellor to seek a common accreditation for Castleton University, Northern Vermont University and Vermont Technical College while maintaining a physical presence at their primary locations and to move forward with aggressive coordination of administrative services system-wide. If approved, I will move forward with issuing an RFP for a professional project manager to assist with implementing the transformation project and we will seek an advisory opinion from NETCHI, our accreditor. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, Jim. You're muted. I'm very impressed on many, many le layers, um, levels. Um, one, Sophie, is um, the manner in which you've presented this, particularly your visual graphic of the different things simultaneously working um, in conjunction with each other from, from left to right, from you know current year um, forward um, is excellent for the visually minded folks like myself that don't do so well with just paragraph after paragraph. Um, it, uh, I could go on for a while, but I just think it's a, tr it's a terrific asset to see it presented in that manner and as well articulated as you have done. So thank you. Thank you very much. I will admit to some technical assistance on the, <laughs> on the PowerPoint. You didn't do it all by yourself? Never mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, Linda. Yeah. Uh, so, um, following on Jim, the, the schedule and the timelines, that's great. I remember also seeing in there some specifics about how we will send benchmarks and things, but um, how are we going to make, how are we going to be better at accountability this time than we have been in the past because it has not been a strong suit and it's no, I, critical now. Yes, it is absolutely critical. Um, I do think that we've in the past few months, we've really focused on the success metrics and that work that we did with the board in the fall. Uh, we went through and we identified, um, you know, key performance indicators about what we realistically think we can accomplish. That will certainly be part of the project planning moving forward. We would want to work with um, a project manager to make sure that we have clear benchmarks and that we are reporting. And that's, again, I think will be the responsibility of the board to hold our feet to the fire um, and make sure that we do it. But I, I think that is the expectation. We won't know if we're succeeding if we're not measuring things. Um, and I think in, in addition to the, if we, if we want to get the additional funding from the legislature, there will be expectations that we demonstrate we are making progress, just saying we're doing it or we're aspiring to do it won't be enough. So I think we need to we need it to do um, for ourselves so that we can demonstrate um, to legislative leaders, to the governor that we are worth continued investment because look at the progress we're making and we're hitting the benchmarks that we've set. Okay, Dylan, and then Sean. Yeah, uh, Sophie, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering, to your point about uh, the General Assembly. Um, oh, sorry, am I muted? No, you're, but quiet. you're, you're, you're not muted, but well. you're quiet. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, I'll do my best here. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering about if you've gotten signals from uh, leaders in the General Assembly throughout the committees on some of the concepts that are here around timeline um, and the steps that will be taken, because I agree with you that the one piece of accountability here that is quite different is that we need an infusion of money for this transition. Mm -hmm. And so in order for this to be successful, and part of what we're responding to is an ask from statewide lawmakers who have said, do this, make it successful, preserve our rural access points. So have you gotten feedback on this plan? Um, and is there any that you think the board should know about as we consider this? Yeah, we, we are quite optimistic. I think it's been very well received in, um, in the State House. We're working closely with legislative leaders. We are very much um, a topic of conversation. We're high on the list, I think, both in the State House, but also 
um, with the governor as well. Um, and we're staying in close touch uh, with the governor's office and with legislative leaders about, about what we're proposing to do. Um, I do know, for example, that the, um, the Senate pro tem uh, had his required reading for her caucus, the select committee report. Uh, we've reached out and talked to different groups of legislators about this. Um, Brian, who you heard from, from NCHEMS, I know has been in front of multiple committees talking to them about the proposal. Um, we have strong support from the two legislator, uh, legislators on the select committee, uh, which is Phil Baruth in the Senate and Kathleen James in the House. Um, so I, I think we're, we're doing all we can to bring um, the legislature along. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's our best, um, most likely avenue to get the, the funding that we need is to stay aligned with what the select committee has recommended. Um, because that's what everyone is sort of expecting us to do. They created the select committee to tell the, you know, provide input and advice as to what, uh, the, what the state should do with the Vermont State College system. And we now have that. Um, I think we can do it. We've done the, the homework internally to see if this is something we could, we could do if it makes sense to us. And we believe that it does. Great. And, and I fixed my microphone now, so <laughs> ho hopefully it's not an issue, but yeah, you, you responded. And, and I just, I really do want to flag this that, you know, this is a really significant consideration for this board is um, as we weigh these decisions and they're big, um, what are the forces at play? And I'm no longer in the general assembly, but I was privy to a lot of those conversations throughout the spring, summer, and fall. Um, and I know the forces that staff was trying to respond to and putting together a thoughtful plan. So this is very challenging, but those types of indications are critical and putting it in the context of the legislature has expectations, I just think is really helpful uh, for us and for folks at home to digest that we are responding to events as they've been thrust upon us in part. And so that's gonna be really key as we continue this discussion today. Sean. find my mute button. Um, well, my question was really around the funding too, and in large part, you've answered that. But, um, uh, you know, one observation I have is that uh, this strategy and what's been laid out by the select committee, there are no half measures here. Um, and and one thing that does make me nervous is, you know, if, if some additional funds are negotiated with the state, but not enough to fully realize the plans, it's not like you just slow the process down, right? You know, oh, we'll do it over a longer time. It all has to happen and it has to happen in a very aggressive timeline. So um, that does give me concern. The other thing, and maybe some of our legislators who are, uh, you know, on this could, could speak to it, but um, I, in general, the way the state funding cycles work, it's on a biennium, you know, thinking beyond two years, for any funding cycle becomes very challenging. And, um, and that's another risk we have with this plan is what happens in year three and four. Yeah, I think for me, that's one reason why going back to, um, to Trustee Milne's point is I think having the, um, you know, having, um, you know, benchmarks and demonstrating that we're making progress. Um, so the select committee has put out in their report five years of you know, what it will take. Uh, we're very clear when we meet with the legislative committees that we're, this, is a, this is an ask, a multi-year ask. So again, not that they can bind future legislators, but they know that this isn't a, you know, a surprise to them that when we come back next year or the year after, um, you know, that this was the expectation was that we receive the funding on an ongoing basis. Um, I do believe, you know, right now there is some additional funding coming into the state um, and, uh, you know, I think there's, there's some thought about is, for example, on the transformation costs, we're, we're asking for $20 million over four years, but that could be front loaded. If there's money this year, that, that could be money that could be provided to us this year that we can then draw down on um, in future years. So we're, we are trying to be, um, you know, creative and explore things with the legislature about how to get the reassurance in terms of the funding moving forward. If, if I may, may, may I just comment that, you know, actually, Sean, 
funding at the legislature is on an annual basis, not even on a biennium basis. Yes, that's right. <laughs> So really, we know everyone needs to understand that we do a one-year budget cycle. Um, and to my point, which I made earlier, and I, I again, I reiterate that this is not just a commitment from the legislature. This must be a commitment from the executive branch, from the governor's office at the very top, uh, through including the legislature, legislature, mm -hmm. legislative leadership, because in fact, this plan calls for commitment over a period of years. It calls for a commitment beyond a single elected legislature. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, in two years, there will be, as we have now, there will be a newly elected legislature, possibly with newly elected leadership. Mm -hmm. The same could be said for the governor's office. Yes. So we in Vermont operate on two-year elected cycles. This plan calls for commitment over multiple elected cycles. So we are actually... It, we can't bind future legislatures and we certainly can't bind newly elected legislatures nor not yet elected future governors if they if there should be a change in leadership at that level so it's it's even more important that we embed the significance of this in the minds of every mm -hmm. stakeholder in Vermont whether in the elected positions or in the positions of the business community, of the of, of every stakeholder community. I mean, we were very encouraged that the governor, you know, did include twenty million dollars for us, and admittedly in one-time funds, but in his um, in his budget, uh, which again it doesn't get us. He's at approximately fifty million. We're asking for sixty-seven point four million. So there's there's still a significant gap there, but at least. Um, you know, we were very encouraged that we were in the budget um, and at such a such an amount. Yeah, if I, if I can make one other comment, and uh, I happen to, uh, I think it is also the case that the Vermont's, the importance and the significance of the Vermont State College system, in my view, as it is at an all time high within the legislative branch of which I'm most familiar. And there are specific excuse me, as we look at, we have workforce issues across the state. I happen to chair a healthcare, the healthcare committee in the house. We have significant healthcare workforce issues. And as we have looked to try to strengthen the healthcare workforce of the state, which is critical, not just myself, but others, external players, as well as those within the building, within the, within the Zoom building, I might add, uh, are, uh, are, looking to the Vermont State Colleges as a key player yeah. in helping to train future healthcare workforce members. Mm -hmm. uh, a specific proposal just was put forward just in the last week around nursing issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to continue to be very responsive. I think it's our opportunity to demonstrate that we as the Vermont State College system are nimble enough to respond to the needs of issues such as increasing train, increased training for the healthcare workforce. That's just happens to be an area that I'm involved in. But again, I think that both the awareness that the state colleges is a tremendous resource, a critical resource is at an all time high. Yeah, I think we, go ahead, you go ahead. I was just gonna say, I mean, I think we, we were able to demonstrate that with the, the CRF workforce initiative that happened in the fall and I know there's some interest in, in having us do that again, uh, maybe for the summer or for the fall um, coming up. But again, I, I, to me, it's very important that we demonstrate to legislators um, the value that we provide to the, to the state and being nimble and responsive to um, things that they're interested in. And that includes workforce development, I think is really critical for us moving forward. Yeah, I just wanna say real quickly that in commerce, um, we are focused almost entirely in the economic development part of our, of our charge with workforce development. We've always dealt with it, but this is like this huge increase in um, awareness and the needs of the work, the, the need of more workers to do more different kinds of things across all sectors is really important. And much of what we do, whether it's the trades or or credentialing or degrees in nursing or 
any other kind of bachelor's degree. I mean, it's really a very broad spectrum and um, that is the focus of the Commerce Committee at this point and the Department of Labor. They've made arrangements in the, in the governor's administration to go and really create a way to find more workers, educate more workers, you know, create a, a, a more sustainable workforce in all sectors. So that, I had concerns about the fact that this was a five-year plan early on last, last summer and mentioned it to a bunch of different people in the legislature and the administration. And under those circumstances, you know, the legislature changes every two years and almost one third of the legislature comes in brand new. So this is a multi-year effort, but I think that because of what we're experiencing with efforts in the past couple of years to really work toward a more to bring people to Vermont for our workforce, I think this is really something where we have an opportunity to really lay the groundwork and maintain that, that momentum. Uh, Adam, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll echo the past compliments on the report. I think it was an amazing job or the proposal rather of synthesizing all of the different things that have been going on different committees and being able to distill it down like this for visual purposes is extremely helpful. The timeline is very helpful. So thank you for that, for all who uh, contributed. Um, the on, specifically on the timeline document um, here, uh, at the very bottom is the strategic financial plan. And it, it doesn't really have a lot of detail. And I assume that's because we don't yet know exactly what that is. Um, but for me, that's almost, and, and, and I don't know if there's necessarily a rank order in this, but um, it almost gets lost down there at the bottom of the page. So uh, I'm not trying to edit your document, but I think more just the, the note of what is that and what's gonna be involved in that, who's gonna be participating, what are the timelines within that, similar to some of the other uh, categories would be helpful for me in, in <clears throat> I forget if, uh, who said it uh, during the, the presentation, but creating those expectations and ensuring that we have expectations around understanding what's in that strategic financial plan and what are those, those uh, key performance indicators and how quickly can we actually anticipate getting those back in order to have an ensure enough timeline. So if after two years from now there's, uh, a change in, in leadership, either at the administration or uh, throughout the, the um, Vermont State House, are we able to then get funds? Or if those funds shrink, what options do we then have in order to keep this going forward? And for me, that's that just remains a big part of my general concern about this is it's not far enough fast enough. Um, but I think the presentation, uh, the proposal that you put here today is, is where we need to be heading and we can't solve it all before we start that journey. Um, but just ensuring that we know we can have those, the understanding as a board, what we're looking to achieve and how we're looking to achieve it um, sooner than later. And then looping back to make sure if things aren't happening, do we have to start looking at additional cuts or are we then looking for more revenue? Uh, and I mean, those are the only two things we have, right? Uh, more revenue or additional cuts. Uh, and, you know, the, the half measures that Sean mentioned, you know, I, I don't see how we really have the ability to be somewhat flexible here. It's we're sort of all in at this point. Um, so yeah, no hard question, Sophie. I don't know if you have any anything that in my comments there that you might wanna to respond to, but um, again, great job on the, on the proposal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we're aiming for the strategic uh, financial plan to be done by this summer, but I, I will, if Sharon is available and has other thoughts on that, I'll let her chime in. Good afternoon. Yes, we are expecting that the strategic financial plan would be done this summer, though I would expect that at the time that we do the um, the review at finance and facilities in May, and again in the board meeting in June, that we'd provide a preliminary update as to where we are in that process so that you're not waiting entirely until the board retreat in sep till September. Anyone else? 
Anyone else? Michael. Thank you, Lynn. I just, I just wanted to give my perspective on that conversation about timeline. Um, I think, it, you know, I think concerns about the timeline are, are legitimate and, and real and Bill Lippert's suggestion about doing everything we can to embed the urgency and the need, particularly the long-term need into the current legislative leadership, the current executive leadership, and, and even more broadly than that, because in case leadership changes, but you know, I think any plan that we propose that is this transformative is going to take more than one, you know, legislative cycle, more than one biennium. Um, so whatever the solution is, I think we're going to have this timeline challenge that we're going to have to confront. And ultimately, you know, it is a risk, but if we're successful in, um, you know, in the path that we've set forward in this, in the, in the um, markers that we plan to hit and we hit those markers, I think we're going to get, you know, continued support from those that are making the decisions as long as we can show the transformation and the success. So I think that's just critical for us to keep in mind and, and uh, not just embedding the um, plan into the decision makers, but specifically over the next two or three years, what are the items, what are the bogeys that we're planning to hit so that we can show uh, our success. And if we do that, I, you know, if we do that, of course, anything can change, but you know, we, one would think we would have a good argument uh, for continued support. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I have a resolution. Megan, are you ready to read the resolution? Lynn, I don't have this resolution. I have the later resolution to go into. Okay, uh, I'll session. read it then. I'm sorry. That's okay, I'll read it, I've got it. So this is resolution 2021-007 for the transformation of the Vermont State College's system. Whereas the Vermont State College's system or the VSCS, which includes Castleton University, Northern Vermont University, Vermont Technical College and the Community College of Vermont was created by Vermont statute in 1961 as a public corporation to plan supervise, administer, and operate facilities for education at the post-secondary level, supported in whole or in substantial part with state funds. And whereas the VSCS mission is for the benefit of Vermont to provide affordable, high quality, student-centered and accessible education, fully integrating professional, liberal and career study, consistent with student aspirations and regional and state needs. And whereas the state created a select committee on the future of public higher education in Vermont, otherwise known as the select committee, to assist the state of Vermont in addressing the urgent needs of the Vermont State Colleges and to develop an integrated vision and plan for a high quality, affordable and workforce connected future for public higher education in the state. And whereas the select committee has made numerous recommendations regarding the future of the VSCS, including A, maintaining the Community College of Vermont as a separate institution while unifying the remaining three institutions under a single leadership structure and accreditation, B, aggressive coordination of administrative services, and C, a significant increase in the amount of state investment in the VSCS to address its structural deficit, mitigate the impact of COVID, and increase its annual base appropriation moving forward. And whereas the select committee's recommendations were informed by information gathered from a wide range of stakeholders concerning their perspectives on higher education in Vermont and the VSCS, as well as the reports and recommendations, recommendations issued by stakeholder groups. And whereas the board of trustees has solicited and received considerable written and oral public feedback on the recommendations of the select committee, as well as other stakeholder reports from both internal and external stakeholders, and whereas the Board of Trustees charged the camp chancellor in consultation with the presidents to consider the recommendations of the select committee in making a recommendation for a transformed organization, governance and operational model for the VSCS that is fiscally sustainable and fulfills the VSCS's mission. And whereas the chancellor has presented her recommendations for the future of the VSCS and the VSCS transformation proposal a 21st century public access system of higher education for Vermont, which includes seeking a common accreditation for Castleton University, Northern Vermont University and Vermont Technical College, maintaining a physical presence at their primary locations along with aggressive coordination 
of administrative services system-wide. And whereas the recommendation is conditioned on the understanding that A, the state provides the VSCS with requisite additional funding, B, the New England Commission on Higher Education, otherwise known as NECI, approves the proposal for a common accreditation of the three institutions and related substantive change proposals. And C, there is no further flare up or worsening of the global pandemic that adversely impacts the operations of the VSCS. Therefore, let it be resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Vermont State College's system hereby approves the trans transformation proposal and directs the chancellor to commence the significant work that will be required to implement her recommendations. Do I hear a motion for the, Karen has a motion. Um, someone second that? Sure. Okay, there's Jim has second that. So we have a motion on the floor and a second. Is there any further discussion on the resolution? Uh, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I I would like to, oh Janet I'm sorry sorry yeah um, and I'm sorry I had to jump off but I think it's important to add to the resolution two things um, one is and forget perfect wordsmithing here but one is um, and uh, and the trustees uh, will be provided with uh, financial projections of revenues and costs and impacts of the actions on an ongoing basis. Um, and the second would be that the um, Chancellor's Office or administration shall continue to identify risks and mitigation strategies around those risks on an ongoing basis. I, I think it's extremely important to put into the resolution, not just a decision being made, but a couple big um, things we need to see to know that these things are progressing at a bigger picture than just the line items of the actions to be taken. And so I think the financial aspect of this, as well as the risk and risk mitigations, because they will change as it goes on, but I think it's very important to be part of the resolution. Okay, is that a motion? Janet? Yes. Okay, I have a motion for an amendment on the floor regarding Financial that. reports. Adam seconds and, that. Okay, okay, Adam seconds that, and and financial financial reporting and uh, risk mitigation. Risk we'll identification. Risk, risk identification. Identification. Yeah. And risk. L Lynn, can you read it again? Or Janet. Um. Well, my my fast notes would be. Um, I don't know if we if we say the administration or the chancellor's office or maybe it's just the trustees uh, shall be provided it. with financial projections of revenues and costs and the impacts of these actions on an ongoing basis and um, the trustees will be provided uh, identified risks and mitigation strategies. Uh, during the implementation of this plan on an ongoing basis. Okay, so that the trustees will be provided with financial projections and costs on an ongoing basis of these projections. And they will also be given information to identify risk and risk mitigations on these, on this on a going forward. That sounds like a motion, correct? And we have a second from Adam. Is that what you're seconding, Adam? Okay. Michael, you have your hand up. Um, do you want to vote on that motion, Lynn, or do you want me? I have a different, some different top, a different point. Okay. But yeah, we're going to have to vote on the amendment first. Anyone have any? We have a, mo a motion on the floor. Any further discussion of the of the motion or the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment, please indicate by saying aye. Uh, any any opposition say nay. The amendment has passed. We now have the resolution. Do you want to talk about the resolution, Michael? Yeah, I just thank you, uh, Chair Dickinson. I just wanted to mention a few things that we've heard during the um, 
you know, during the listening session and in collecting uh, feedback uh, from the stakeholders within the campuses and the communities, you know, we heard um, concerns around losing identity and, and losing uh, branding, uh, concerns around uh, CCV not being included, and I think concerns around faculty and staff having a voice within the board. I mean, those are the three that I saw to be the most reoccurring. And I think the discussion today was really helpful on, on all of those points. Um, you know, the NECHI representatives and NECHI consultants made, I think, really strong arguments for why CCV is different, why its business model is different, why it should be separate. It's financially stable as it is now. But also the fact that Vermont is not necessarily um, focused like other states are on meeting students where they are and servicing their needs. I think what I heard from the NECHI consultants is that we have maybe too much of a focus on traditional four-year degrees relative to other states and that yeah. that's part of the issue that the system is having. So I think that's the strongest argument for keeping CCV right where it is while we engage in this transformation plan. On the branding issue, I think we just need to be mindful of that as we you know, engage in this work about how do we, you know, how do we transition to this, this system, but maintain the individuality of the campuses and, and the schools, because there is certainly value there um, in what each of the institutions, not any one in particular, but each of them have been able to develop. And then on the faculty and staff front, you know, again, as we engage in these discussions, I think it's worth thinking about, is there an opportunity to have a representative on the board um, so that there is that direct line of communication? We heard that in the comments and thought it was a good um, a good suggestion. And we heard that I think it was 22% of other systems have some sort of representation on the board, whether voting or non-voting uh, representation. So something to think about as we move through the process, nothing that I think, at least from my perspective, needs to be included in the resolution, but wanted to mention that before we voted. Important points. Okay, uh, Dylan, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, just in a similar vein. I mean, I've been trying to process all this as I know we all have, but I continue to come back to this question of uh, what does the Vermont State Colleges system need to be successful, but more importantly, what do the students need? And so as I grappled as well with the Community College of Vermont and how this fits in, especially as someone who attended CCV at a number of sites around the state online, um, you know, I just came back to, uh, for students who attend CCV, or any other post-secondary institution, um, they're really thinking about how do they build skills and how do they do it and afford it. And so, so much of the work we do and what we're being asked to do through transformation is gonna be about achieving that, about providing students more opportunities, um, making them more affordable. And with that, I think comes an obligation that our state leaders, uh, our governor and our legislators fund the state colleges system. And this is a path to do it. So as I reflect on my experience, both as a student, um, the experiences of our students who are presently in the system and our faculty and others, there's a lot of agreement there. And so it's about ensuring we have a system that meets those kids where they are or meets those students where they are, wherever they may be in life. So I believe this is the best structure to do it. There's going to be a lot of accountability built in. I'm glad we just approved a resolution to add to that. And I know everyone is pulling in the same direction. So I'm prepared to support this and I do hope that it will lead to the best outcomes for our state and that it will get us the resources we need to do it the best we can. Bill. Well, I have a, I have a comment and a question. Uh, the, the first, uh, the comment is that there's also, I, I think the, the structural plan to have CCV remain independent and very visible, but a, a but a integral part of the Vermont State College system uh, also provides particular opportunities for further outreach to those Vermonters who are not currently engaging in further higher education. It's it's a it's a it's an entryway that is uh, uniquely positioned to give people the opportunity, give Vermonters the opportunity to test their interest in future higher, in further higher education. And I also, at a national level, I think there's an increasing recognition of the role that community colleges are playing. 
across across the nation, and that it may uh, that there may be federal opportunities that present themselves uh, in the new administration that will uh, further strengthen, particularly the community college systems, not only uh, or of the of the country, and that we would be well positioned then uh, to have a visible. But we already have a very successful community college system, but have a visible community college system ready and able to adapt further to any national uh, changes that may may develop. So then I have so that's a comment more than a question. Uh, but I do have a question which I, I failed to ask earlier. And uh, Sophie, I had to step off briefly for another. There was a conflict I had, and I had to step off. So if this was already discussed. Please just say so, and then I will follow up later. But there are several key pivot. There are several pivotal decisions that this, as this resolution points out, uh, one is the funding, one is the approval by NECI of the accreditation, and one of the key early pieces, uh, in fact, in this year, as I recall, is asking for an advisory opinion from NECI about the possible accreditation. And so I'm personally interested in hearing more uh, about any in the way we same way that we've talked about. Well, have there been signals from the legislature about funding? Well, have there been any preliminary conversations that it's appropriate to talk about uh, with Nechi? And if not, that I can understand that sometimes we need to just keep talking and not put them on the front burner yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I frankly, that's a that's a key piece. Because if Nechi does not signal through an advisory opinion that there's a possibility of a successful accreditation in the way that this is outlined, and if subsequently that accreditation does not occur, that is a key pillar of this entire proposal. And so I, I think it's useful to perhaps to the degree you can help us understand whether what you think the likelihood is of a positive advisory opinion being issued. Yeah, no, and so you're you're right. It is a critical step, and if we don't, if we uh, flub it, that's not going to help us uh, down the road. Um, we did well, reach out to Nechi already. Help us it take take apart one of the foundational issues. Uh, we did reach out to Nechi and um, had a very preliminary conversation with them. Um, as a result of that conversation. Um, came about the proposal that we we look to hire um, a, an incoming president for the combined entity sooner rather than later, um, and have uh, that president on board working on you know looking ahead and building the governance, um, the marketing, the brand, etc. Uh, for the combined institution and have them on board sooner, um, and overlap with the existing uh, three individual institutions. Uh, Nechi was very clear. I mean, until until if, if it's July 1 of 2023, those the three um, institutions have to maintain their accreditation right up until the eve of that day. Um, and so that was kind of a, a, they, they didn't tell us that's what we had to do, but it was thrown out there as a suggestion of something we should think about. So we take that pretty seriously. Um, we will do an, a, a request and advisory opinion to make sure that what we're proposing um, is something that's likely to fly. Um, advisory opinions, uh, really it's more a question of this is, we think this will comply with what your standards are. You know, Do you have any concerns that this wouldn't meet the standards kind of thing? They're not gonna say we bless it ahead of time, um, but hopefully they would identify if there were any particular concerns about it. Uh, we do also plan to reach out to the U.S. Department of Education to make sure that there aren't any um, concerns there before we would move forward. Um, but I, I think based, I mean, when when we did Johnson and Linden and unify them into Northern Vermont University, we were kind of out ahead of everybody. Um, but in New England, um, a number of these kinds of proposals are being considered. So between Maine having the single accreditation for their system. The community college system in Connecticut right now is going through a consolidation process. And I know the governor in New Hampshire just made an announcement. I don't know if that got vetted by Nechi before he made the announcement, but he made an announcement about consolidation um, in New Hampshire. So I think that, you know, again, higher education is changing. I think the NCHEMS group um, 
just pointed that out as well, is that these are conversations that aren't unique to Vermont that need to be happening, you know, across the country. Um, but yeah, that's, we will, we will make sure that, you know, we're, we're crossing all our T's and dotting all our I's with Nechi um, early enough that it's not an issue uh, when we get down to the end. I, I find that helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? We have a motion on the floor. If there are no more questions, all those in favor of the um, motion that's been amended, please indicate by saying, go ahead, David, you go. Aye. Oh, I was voting to <laughs> say aye. All those aye. in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. No opposed, I see it. The resolution has passed. And that is, uh, now, Sophie, your work is cut out for you. <laughs> As is the work of the board, but yes. That's uh, cut out for us too. Time. Yes, we're all in this together. Okay, uh, we have a report from the audit committee and we have a motion on that regarding O'Connor and Drew. Um, Linda Milne is the chairman of the audit committee. Would you like to give a report on that? Is there someone you need some? Uh, no, I can uh, give the um, report. The uh, audit committee voted out a resolution proposing the extension of our audit agreement with O'Connor and Drew um, for external audit services for an additional three years. They've been, um, they went out to bid four years ago when we are in 2020 is the last year of that. Our uh, Contracting policies allow an extension of um, one time for um, up to three years. Given where the system is financially and with all the stresses we uh, have to do the, do, the members of the audit committee felt this was a really important time for continuity of our auditors. Um, We've had a lot of staff turnover. We've got you know, a new CFO starting uh, um, July 1. We've got a new controller. We've got the financial stresses of COVID-19 and the losses. Um, O'Connor and Drew, our auditors already know our systems. They already know a lot about us. That puts a lot less stress on our staff if they're not having to educate new auditors. Um, it puts a lot less stress on our staff if they don't have to go out to bid right now on top of everything else we're asking them to do. And so for those reasons, the audit committee uh, recommends that the board approve the, um, the resolution to, um, I'll just read the result part. Um, Resolved that the Board of Trustees of Vermont State Colleges authorize a renewal of the audit services contract with O'Connor and Drew for the periods ending June 21, fiscal years ending June 21, June 22, and June 30, 2023. Oh, and a, a good point you might like to uh, know, um, our current contract cost is 170,000. For next year, they're proposing same price, and then up to 175 the next year and 180 the next year. So the, and those are the maximum caps that they could uh, charge this year. So I think pricing wise, they were, um, given all we've got going on, I thought they, it was a fair proposal. So I propose, what's the term? I, uh, you make a motion to accept the I make a motion to approve this resolution. Okay, do we have a second on that? Second, Janet. I'll second. Thank you. Janet seconds it. Okay. Any discussions or questions on the decision about the audit agreement? Seeing none. All those in favor of uh, accepting the resolution to go into another three-year agreement with O'Connor and Drew for audit services, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed. I think we've passed that one. Okay. We have a report from Finance and Facilities. Um, David? Yes, indeed. So one of the uh, uh, 
more pleasurable things that we have a chance to do on uh, finance and facilities is to consider and recommend scholarships uh, that are being endowed for one of our uh, colleges uh, or universities. And in this case, um, there is a proposal for a new uh, Carol and Joanne Laws Engineering Scholarship for uh, Vermont Technical College. Uh, the Finance and Facilities Committee uh, reviewed this and uh, agreed to recommend this uh, to the full board. And I would like to uh, invite uh, President Moulton to make any remarks she may like to about this, but uh, obviously always wonderful news to have a, a scholarship program. Thank you very much, David. Um, I would just quickly say that we're very excited about this. Uh, Carol and um, Joanne Laws are uh, donating this, making this endowment available for engineering students. They particularly want to see young ladies get into engineering and uh, we're very excited because they've created both an endowment and made an, a, a donation that we can use immediately for scholarships to attract folks to those programs. So we're very excited about this and very grateful. Okay, so do we have a motion to accept the conditions of the scholarship? I would make that motion. A second on that. Mary seconds it. Okay, any discussion or questions on this uh, scholarship opportunity for VTC? Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Um, Thank you very much. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to accept the scholarship from the um, Carol and Joanne Laws Engineering Scholarship from the family, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Seeing none. Is there anything else that we need to talk about from the Finance and Facilities Committee? Can I just bring up one thing? Maybe Pat, you can answer this. So Carol Laws is very well known in the civil engineering world, right? Um, and uh, I'm quite sure he's a member of the Society of Professional Engineers and a whole bunch of other groups in Vermont. And I don't know what your publicity plans are or can be, but I'll tell you hitting up those organizations and I can probably help you find them, track them all down and suggest others do the same. Um, I would strike while the iron is hot on that because he is so well known and respected in the state of Vermont as an engineer, you might, you might get others to lean in with that. Perfect idea, Janet, thank you very much. I spent about an hour on the phone with him and was very impressed with where we're heading and uh, very impressed with what we're doing. So we will strike while the iron's hot, thank you. Excellent idea. Thank you, Janet. Okay. Was there anything else in finance and facilities that was... Uh, there were other items we discussed, but we'll need to talk about those in our executive session. Okay. Okay. We also have a report from the nominating committee, and we have a new chair of the nominating committee, uh, Adam Grinnell. We did vote for you, didn't we? <laughs> uh, Thank you, Chair Dickinson. So yeah, uh, the committee met on February 9th. Uh, we um, went into executive discussion or executive session rather to discuss possible nominees for the board elected positions. So if, uh, if everyone recalls, there's both governor appointed, uh, legislative appointed and uh, governor appointed positions. Um, and so we were addressing the uh, we were addressing the um, board elected position. So uh, come after we came out of executive session, there was a motion made uh, to recommend to the board, uh, trustees Lanou and Bombardier for board election. So that's what we're here to present to the board today. And I believe if that's right, uh, looking for a, a motion to approve those two for election. Is that a motion? That was a motion or recommendation made by okay. the committee, yes. Okay, we need a second on that. Sure. Seconded? sure. Some, someone else, you know? It's okay, Jim. Second and a third, okay. Any discussion on the way that, the, the way that it has been transitioned for the past few years is that they were going to be uh, some board appointed, self-appointed board members 
and the governor would transition to from four and previously to three this year. We had five people and um, we have given some names to the governor as well. Some of them are very familiar names um, that we all know. But um, we have the nomination for the board appointees and they are Karen Luno and um, Jennifer Barge. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of electing Karen Luno and Jennifer Barge to, I believe, four-year terms on the board. Please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. It appears we have congratulations to Janet and to Karen. Um, additional business. Uh, Sophie, do you have any more additional business that we may have? The only, the only one was we were proposing to add a board meeting on May 10th. Um, right now we have a board meeting scheduled for Saturday, March 27th, which is we traditionally do on a Saturday because of the legislative session. And then we have our regularly scheduled meeting in the middle of June, June 16th. But again, given all the work we have ahead of us, we thought it might be a good idea to schedule um, a meeting in between those two. So we were looking at um, May 10th, which I believe is a Monday, um, to add that into your schedule. Okay. What time? Um, well, normally we've been starting at one, but if there's, you know, again, open if there's uh, other other ideas on the timing. Okay, so we need a we need a motion for that. Is someone? willing to make a motion to add a May 10th Board of Trustee meeting. So moved. Mary and Linda can second. Okay, any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor of uh, adding a date for May 10th for the Board of Trustees, please indicate uh, by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it appears to pass. Uh, there's also some informational purposes. We have a new diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Uh, Sophie, do you want to talk about that? That's also scheduled in March. Yeah, I just wanted to let people know that that's the first meeting of that is scheduled for March, Friday, March 12th. And then we have um, an EPSL and long range planning committee meeting scheduled for Monday, March 15th. Okay. Any questions or discussions on that? Thank you to the people who will serve on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, is there any other additional business that we need to be discussing? Seeing none, we will go to comments from the public. We will be going to executive session. After we finish this section of the agenda, uh, we are going, we have a large group, I believe, of people who have signed up or might be interested in speaking. Uh, we're going to take about a half an hour on that. I'm going to do similar to what I did on Wednesday. Um, Jim Poirier will be the person who will be the host. We're asking so that we can get as many in, people in as possible that you speak for about three minutes so we can hear from as many of you who are here to, to speak and get, get the comments in. Um, we appreciate many of you were here. Some of you were here on Wednesday uh, and in previous discussions we've had from the public. But... Uh, Jen, is there someone who you want to start with? Uh, is anyone who has signed up? Uh, Chair Dickinson, actually, um, a number of people signed up that are actually not on the Zoom meeting. So we do have one person, and okay. that is that is Beth Walsh. So Beth, if you're there, we would love to hear your comment. Hi, thanks. And I'm not going to take three minutes. I'll just take a minute or two. Um, I just want to say I'm really excited for all of the work ahead of us all. It's exciting, it's, it's transformational, and I'm hoping that the, the uh, leadership in Montpelier or wherever they may be uh, is ready to take it on and support us. Um, I do want to once again um, propose or advocate for expanding the governance uh, structure of the Vermont State Colleges. Um, I don't think that NSHEMS addressed it very well, and I don't see a downside to including faculty and staff and more voices at the table. Uh, the fact that we have to wait until all the decisions are made before our voices are heard at a meeting is disappointing. And I think we'd be much better served to have faculty and staff um, 
at the table. And there is a Senate bill number 37, I believe put out by uh, Senator P uh, Polina and a couple of other senators um, that expands the governance of the VSC. So I'm hopeful that that will pass and that we can um, all work on this together. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Jen, is there anyone else? There is not, Chair Dickinson. We're all set. Okay, all right. Um, okay, we will have a, um, an executive session. Um, Megan, do you have the motion for that? I do indeed have this motion. Okay. I move the Board of Trustees enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313A2 to discuss negotiating or securing real estate purchase, sale, or lease options, and 1 VSA 313A1A to discuss contracts, 1 VSA 313A1B to discuss labor relations agreements with employees, and 1 VSA 313A1F for the purpose of receiving confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services. Because premature general public knowledge of these discussions would place VSC at a substantial disadvantage, it is appropriate for the committee to enter executive session. Along with the members of the board present at this meeting, in its discretion, the board invites the chancellor, VSC chief financial officer, general counsel, and the deans of administration of Vermont Technical College, Community College of Vermont and Northern Vermont University and all presidents to attend. Upon conclusion of the first portion of the executive session, the board invites the chancellor, general counsel and James Page to attend the second portion of the executive session. No formal or binding action shall be taken in executive session except for actions relating to real estate transactions. Okay, is that a motion? A second? Yes. Linda says it's a second. Any discussion on going into executive session? Seeing none, all those in favor of entering executive session, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now we're going into a breakout room. Is that correct? Yes, you'll see your invitation. Thank you. We don't have anything else on our agenda. We will, um, I want to thank everyone for all their hard work today. Thank you, Sophie. That was um, really very productive and very helpful for all of us. I Could I just that. add quickly, I just want to make clear that I had enormous uh, support and help from the trustees. We did, we did take the consult with the president seriously and we've had extensive um, discussion internally and their help was really uh, important in drafting what we what we put forward today so I feel bad I didn't say it before when we had more people but um, I did want to recognize all the work that they've put in as well working with us well, thank you yes and uh, there is no action to be taken now we're out of executive session of 5 15 we did this in four hours and 15 minutes not bad <clears throat> with that I need a motion to adjourn so moved. Move. Bill on. Second. Bill will say second. Okay. okay. Almost, any discussion on adjourning? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just, I just want to thank Megan and Sophie for all the hard work on the select committee. And I don't know if Joyce is still, yes. Joyce. Yes, Joyce. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't, whoever else from our system, and there were others who worked on that boy, yeah, boy, that was a lot of work, and you, you came through with a, I think, a quality product in a short amount of time, and may God bless us all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, would, thank you Karen. I would just, yeah, I would just acknowledge we had uh, Dan Daly, who's a faculty member yeah. from NVU Linden. We had Devin Tingle, who's a student at Vermont Technical College, and we had. Um, uh, Jeff Weld, who's an alum and former employee from Castleton, were the other three uh, Vermont State College representatives on the select committee, and they they also um, participated and, and contributed to the to the yeah. report. Well, thank you all, really. Thank you. That product, the product of your report. There's a lot of work in there. Yeah, yeah. And you're not done yet. <laughs> Just the start. <laughs> right. <laughs>
Well, I just want to say we have a motion on the floor to adjourn. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much. We will be in touch and see all of you soon. Thank so you. Then we thank. Done. <laughs> thank you. Bye.